Um, good evening. Welcome to the May 1st, 2024, 5.45 p.m. Uh, select board meeting. This meeting will be held in a hybrid fashion with the opportunity for both in-person attendance and remote participation. Please note that while an option for remote attendance and or participation is being provided as a courtesy to the public, the meeting will not be suspended or terminated if technological problems interrupt the virtual broadcast unless otherwise required by law. Members of the public with particular interest in a specific item on the agenda should make plans for in-person versus virtual attendance accordingly. This meeting will be held in person in the main meeting room of the Deerfield Municipal Office offices in accordance with Mass General Law, Chapter 30A. Anyone intending to record this meeting must identify themselves to our clerk, Trevor McDaniel, and provide their name and address for the record. So I'm opening the meeting at um, 548. Thank you. Um, so we've called it to order. First item on the agenda is a uh, Leary Law update. We have a memo from Chris and uh, uh, Chris Nolan, our uh, assistant, and we have a contract from Rivermore Consulting, uh, an addendum item. And Chris is recommending that we sign it. I don't know if, uh, have you both um, had a chance to read it? Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm going to read. Yeah, just two, two seconds. But if you want to talk about it in the okay. meantime, Chris, um, Chris, would you like to just go over, do a general summary? Happily. So thank you for having me tonight and for agreeing to push the start time of the meeting up. So I have time to explain the addendum and answer any questions you might have. Um, I've received the addendum attached uh, from John Tortolot, the uh, co-founder, owner of Rivermore Energy, who we've been working with through the Leary Lot project. Um, we brought Rivermore on around November of 2022 uh, when it became clear that there was a need for EV charging to be a part of this project. Um, and I think we have done an outstanding job working with them. Um, and we could not have gotten nearly as far as we have without their assistance. Um, it was with Rivermore's help that we were able to secure the CFI grant for about $2.46 million successfully from the federal government. Um, I have almost daily check-ins with John Tortolot and David Pomerantz, who are both being employed by Rivermore Energy for the purposes of this project. Um, we have a very good rapport working relationship with each other and with our architect, Jeff Squire of Berkshire Design Group. Um, and you can see in the attached documentation, there is the addendum um, I know there might be a bit of a sticker shock factor with the addendum uh, coming with an added cost of $400,000, but I can also add that that is entirely paid for by the CFI grant. Um, the short version, and you can see more specific details in the budget forms attached, um, but the grant itself is for about $2.46 million. Um, the construction costs are not going to be above $2 million. There, that Even $2 million is a bit of a high estimate. So we have leftover money in the grant fund to pay for things like consulting services, um, administrative costs. Um, and, and you can see all of that broken down in the budget attachment. But I think mm -hmm. I want to make the recommendation that we continue our working relationship with Rivermore Energy um, that we've, we've had great results from them so far, and I have faith that we can keep moving forward in a positive direction if we move forward with this so, addendum. So we have, uh, Chris, we have, just to summarize, we have construction costs of about $2 million, right? Or and less. Or less. Over six we have this contract of 400000 so it leaves us maybe 60 ish thousand, uh, com not, I mean, extra, or left over from this grant, right? Um, I don't feel comfortable committing to any specific numbers of what's going to be left over now. Um, however, we do have a very generous amount in grant funding compared to the construction that we have proposed. So, so, um, so it's I, like a contingency fee. We have we we expect to have leftover money from the. 2.46 million CFI grant 
uh, after paying for construction and uh, Rivermore, I mean, uh, Tortolette and company services. I would say there is a good chance of that. Yes. Okay. And and we have and are you uh, incorporating the MVP grant money as well? Um, I'm incorporating that into the match component. So, yeah. um, the the match is going to be made up of a couple of different parts. Um, there is going to be at minimum the state EVIP grant that we successfully received all the way back in 2022 at this point. And because of the, the fluid nature of this project, we've been able to successfully see it extended a couple of times now. Um, there's the EVIP grant, which is about $19,000. There is uh, the MVP funding can also serve as part of that match. Um, and we are currently waiting on guidance regarding whether we can use Eversource's uh, make ready funding that's being used to fund the ongoing work that you'll see happening at the Leary lot right now. Um, we're being funded by Eversource for some of that work, and there's a chance that some of that can be part of our match, but I, I'm, I'm waiting exact guidance on that right now, and that is something I'll keep you all updated on. Um, and then the remaining portion of the match um, is likely going to come at least somewhat from ARPA, whether it's the full 495000 that was originally allocated by the board or whether we're able to bring that down in response to Eversource Make Ready funding being available as part of the match. Um, that's something I obviously want an answer to, and I'll I'll keep you all in the loop on whatever answer I'm able to find for that, but that's that's a little bit of an uncertainty right now. Okay. Uh, Chris, you had a question? No. Chris Harris? Yeah, so I just have a comment because if you think about 400,000 in extra consulting and engineering fees versus the 2 million in construction, that's 20%. That's a pretty healthy um, estimate. That's good, I think. It's appropriate. 20%? Uh, it just seems high to me. I don't. I, I mean, I could be way wrong on that, but... For uh, any project I've ever done, capital, if you're doing it right, you always have at least 15% in for extra engineering consulting. It <clears throat> seems really high to me. Well, there's two factors that I... I just mentioned one is that they've been working for us for almost, when did they start, Chris, 2022? November of 2022 is when we brought them on board. And they've, they've built this, I, I don't even know if they've built it, but it's $28,000 for for securing, writing and securing a 2.46 million grant, um, having the knowledge that's required to work with uh, level two and level three installations like this, understanding all of the engineering and um, interaction with, you know, an electricity provider like Eversource. So uh, we're playing, paying for expertise and, and yeah, I, I, I agree with Chris. That well, the, the total broken. project is 3,778,265. So that makes it less than 20%. So here's the here's the total. It's thirty percent. If you take three million dollars and divide it by four hundred thousand, it's a thirty percent charge. Do you thirty percent? Right? It's a thirty percent. You're doing it backwards. You're going backwards. So you divide four four hundred thousand by three million. Of of two million. No, 13. Yeah. It's 13%. 13 it's 13%. Great. It's 13%. So 13% 13 for engineering on a $3 million project. I feel better about that. That was Yeah. Yes. And it, and it's yeah, these are grant funds. And I just rounded it off to the lowest 3 million, but Yeah, well. So Chris, what do we need to do tonight to move this forward? Do we We just vote vote to sign it? So, if the board feels comfortable, um I would really appreciate if you're willing to approve this addendum to Rivermore's contract. Um, we can continue our working relationship with them. Um, if you do have any outstanding questions, I'm happy to bring them to Don directly, and I'm, I'm sure he can provide any information that you're looking for. Um, but I, I think overall, um, we're very happy with the results that we've gotten so far from them. 
Um, yes. And so, yeah, if you're if you're willing to approve this addendum, I think that would go a long what way. Does that mean what does that mean when the when can we start the Leary lot? Do we have we signed the contract for the federal contract yet? Um, we have submitted it. We have submitted our share of the federal contract. Uh, we're waiting on final execution from them, um, and we expect that there will be some comments, particularly in regard to one section that it sounds like every single one of the 47 entities that are awarded have not been clear on how we're supposed to complete it. Um, so that's that's a developing situation, um, but we are ahead of the curve in terms of getting this executed. Um, and we have received the go ahead to start acquiring um, more fees. Essentially, we are eligible to use uh, we're eligible for reimbursement of the funds that we've acquired, even though ordinarily um, you need to have a fully executed grant agreement first. I will say Federal Highway Administration has been very agreeable and um, amenable to the fact that we have such a shovel ready project already from the get go. And that means that they're they're willing to grant us some flexibility and what they ordinarily wouldn't be reimbursing. Um, so. That being said, um, today I was working with Rivermore on putting together an exact schedule for what we're looking for. Um, and it looks like we are going to be releasing an IFB within the next, I would say, week optimistically. Um, getting this ready to go out to bid uh, with a bid deadline of late May. Um, contract execution with a site and civil contractor in early June for work to begin in the month of June. Um, and then be completed ideally by September. So that's not a that, that's not a timeline I'm comfortable being held to, but that is ideally um, how things will be looking at the moment. Oh no, that's wonderful. I just wanted to make sure we got started. Okay, great. Okay. So um, are you prepared to in entertain a motion at this point? Yes. Okay. Can we just and we will we we can have to make a motion and second it, and then we can have okay, discussion. Great. Thank you. So I make a motion to approve the addendum uh, as uh, presented by the assistant town administrator. I'll second for discussion. So discussion. Okay, just I just need a couple minutes here. Something that uh, I, I did want to to express because I was jotting down ideas about budgeting today and exploring some of the different alternatives that are possible um and on a very positive note regardless of the different kinds of funding that we're considering for meeting the match requirement um, i can confidently say that not a cent of this project is being funded by local tax dollars so um regardless of if we meet our match through arpa whether we meet it through mvp uh, make ready funding evip regardless of what uh, combination of things are used? Um, I, I can say it's it's entirely external funding, which is um, if, which is when, great news. When do the MVP funds uh, grant money end? Is are we if if we get this project done in September, will we have met the deadline for the MVP grant money? Because that's uh, so. Be I've actually I've been in touch with Andrew Smith. Um, who's our regional MVP coordinator about that question, um, because I explained to him our situation where we had expected to be further along in this project, but then we had the the good problem of getting a massive federal grant that we needed to do some additional planning and execution for. Um, and he said that's that's definitely a worthwhile reason to be granted an extension, and he doesn't think we would have any issue. With receiving oh, one because I, I i thought pretty sure that we were the mvp money was going to end i mean because we hadn't used it uh ordinarily the mvp grant funding would be pulled back in june um, because that's the end of the fiscal year and this was intended to be a fiscal 2024 project um however being given an extension uh, would, would allow us to spend the money on that in, okay. the, in the months but after the as long as, get the RFP out, if we, uh, as long as it goes out to bid, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm sure we'll get a grant uh, extension. That one, yeah, that it one. should it it should be well underway at that point. All right. I just wanted to go through this just a couple more pages if I could. Yeah, no, this is sure. the most important. 
Yeah, I, I, yep, I saw that. I was just going to go through responsibilities. Okay. With with the federal grant, there's a lot more hoops you got to. Oh, I know. Yeah, absolutely. And and if and if I don't. I don't want to say our staff can't do it, but I, I just there's caps. Yeah, this it, it is wicked a lot. So to have someone else do it and be responsible for it is really important. Mm -hmm. And if they're getting paid by the grant, right? This is going to be such a fancy parking lot. <laughs> we got can, so much money for it. It should be a draw for EV people. Yeah, uh, it will be beautiful. There will be. It's it's not even. That it looks good. Mm -hmm. I mean, if there's a high speed EV charger and you it's want to come into town, draw. charge your car in full and get out of town. It's a huge draw for our businesses. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's going to really make a lot of difference a, for really restaurants. It really is an economic game changer for Berkshire Brew mm -hmm. and our restaurants. And our restaurants. Yeah. Definitely. And I, I don't see any reason why it can't be a model project for what rural EV ch public charging projects should look like. Um, Right. We're, we were the smallest municipal entity in the country to receive this grant, which I think is is definitely noteworthy. Um, there are there is definitely a big push for adoption of EV technology here in the community, which is is fantastic because that's not found in rural communities in a lot of cases. So um, I, th I think we really have potential to be something groundbreaking here. Okay, I'm good. You're good. Yep. Okay. I just wanted I just needed to read through that. All right. Sure. Sure. No, that's all right. It, it it's we it didn't come until just a little while ago. Um, I had the advantage of having talking with Chris, you know, periodically. Yeah. To I read, I read every it. three days. My wow. day job is taking me. I know. Yeah. No, no. no, I just I read it. I just all right. I read it before. Um, you know, so today this afternoon. Local funds is like four fifty, which is our ARPA. No, no. Is that different than this? Well, yeah. If we have state funds, local funds, the grant, 2.4. The, the local funds might still be ARPA, just to be clear. Right. Um, it, it, it might be ARPA, but we also might be able to satisfy that with a combination of uh, the Make Ready funds from Eversource and the uh, MVP grant and the EVIP okay. grant. So okay. if just... uh, the, make re the Make Ready is the, is the changing factor there, um, that's right. the one that we need reassurance on um so okay um if if make ready does not work we will have to use some arpa funding to meet the match um okay right i i, I, I want to make sure the board understands but, that but by hiring them the chances of eversource reimbursing us and covering a that is a lot is yeah. a lot more they were the ones that actually identified and eversource agreed to give us this money and then they're trying to take it back so the federal law is pretty clear that they're they're not allowed to do that and I, I don't know if it was Tor letter or the other gentleman who really keyed us up to that. And 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 it, uh, no, it was David Pomerantz. And David, Pomerantz. yeah, okay. and David is mm -hmm. going to chase it down for right. sure. And so that takes time too. Okay. All right. So um, so the motion is to authorize signing this, having mm -hmm. the chair sign this. Having no, the chair. it's it's to have. Um, I don't know if it's a chair. I, I don't think there's a specific name on the signature line, um, but because of the the high price of this contract, I, th I think it would be helpful for at least one member of the board to sign. Do I need to? Yeah, just make so board. Yeah. All right. Move. So I'm gonna, I will withdraw my original motion and um, and I will make a new motion, which is to authorize the chair of the select board to sign the uh, addendum agreement with uh, uh, Rivermore. Rivermore. I'll second that motion. All those in favor? Tim Hilchey, aye. Trevor McDaniel, aye. Carolyn Ness, aye. Thank you. Thank you, Chris, for doing so much legwork on that. And thanks for the explanation. It made me feel a lot better. Absolutely. And if you think of any other questions, I'm happy to talk for the rest of the week and after if, if there's any outstanding things or things that you think of that are bothering you about any of the Leary lot, um, please feel free to be in touch. I have been working on this every day. So it's it's sometimes when 
you think of something, um, it might not necessarily be something I've thought of before, and we can help solve a problem before it arises. Just, so one, one question I had was the um, the application numbers are different than Schedule D. Schedule D is what we're doing, correct? Correct. So the application numbers, um, we had requested a very large sum compared to what we knew we needed. Um, yeah. And and no doubt we could have found use if we had received a, a four million dollar grant. Um, yeah. But the amount that we did receive was two point four six million. So that's what we've been working with. Great. Okay. Sounds good. Thank, Thank you. you, Chris. Are you Thank off you. of class? <laughs> I am heading out to class. I've got class at six thirty. Um, but I think I I, I I think I gave um. A, a few more details regarding Leary lot updates in my assistant town administrator report, which is in your packet. Okay, um, yeah. But again, if anybody has any further questions, feel please feel free to get in touch with me. Will do. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Have Thank you all very much. Have a great night. Thank you. Um, since we're running a little behind, um, we're going to delay public comment for just a few minutes and have John Briggs from the Pioneer Valley Mosquito District. Um, it be introduced and help us on the treatment plan that where he's talking oh, about. Yes. John, can you're on. Hey, John. Hi, everyone. Thanks for having me. Uh, do you have the handouts by any chance? Yes. All right. Awesome. That's great. Um, I can share my screen to put it up on the monitor if you'd like, or I can just go through uh, each sure, page of the sure handout. Would be helpful. Uh, yeah, we actually yeah. have. I think we have people that would be interested in hearing about it, John. Okay. Let me see. Oh, okay. I can't share. All right. So I'll just go by the handout. All right. So just a quick background for the last few weeks, I've spent a considerable, a considerable amount of time surveying potential vector species habitat, specifically habitat that's conducive John, to- do you think you could get a little bit closer to the mic so that we can hear you a little bit more? Okay, let me, can you hear me now? Is this oh, good? That's, that's much yeah. better. All right, it's it's my headphones, sorry. Um, that works. <laughs> so um, just a quick background for the last few weeks, I've spent a considerable amount of time surveying potential vector species habitat, specifically habitat that's conducive to supporting mosquito species cap capable of transmitting Triple E and West Nile virus. Uh, based on what I'm seeing, it looks like this year will likely yield a healthy number of mosquitoes. You know, we had a considerable amount of rain um, in the winter, and that definitely affects how mosquitoes are going to, you know, the populations of mosquitoes that we're going to see in the spring and also going into the summer. Um, so with, with how Tripoli ended last year in Hamden County, I'm a bit concerned, uh, to say the least, about uh, the coming season. So really the objective of the proposed larval mitigation plan is to reduce the risk of arbovirus transmission to humans and animals by targeting uh, vector species habitat. So in South Deerfield, I surveyed uh, roughly 10 areas uh, where there was potential for mosquito breeding. Uh, and where how I discovered these areas is by using mass DEP wetlands layer uh, through GIS software. So they'll label all these different uh, uh, categories of wetlands, which is very important when you're looking at specific mosquito species, such as vector species. Uh, for instance, Culicida melanora, it's a primary vector for Triple E. You're looking for deciduous swamps in, in, um, in that respect. So for the first site, um, that's located on North Main Street and that's a deciduous swamp. It's uh, the vector species that I'm looking to target with treatment would be Ocleratodus canadensis. It's a bridge vector for Tripoli e and West Nile virus. Um, and a bridge vector is a mosquito that will feed on both avian species and mammals. They'll have a mixed blood meal. So they'll feed on, they'll get a partial blood meal on a bird that's pot potentially infected and then get the rest of that blood meal on humans or a mammal, and that's pretty much how they, they bridge the vector over to humans. Um, so so uh, a clear a clear totus candidensis is you know plays a primary role in the transmission of arbovirus, arboviruses in Massachusetts. The other species I'm looking for in that type of habitat is Culix salinarius. Um, they're also a potential bridge vector for Tripoli and West Nile virus. 
So we have, unfortunately, we have a lot of bridge vectors and a lot of potential bridge, bridge vectors. And really, it's just a matter of those primary vectors such as Culicida melanura and, and Culex pipiens amplifying the virus among the wild bird population. Once it's amplified to a certain extent, now you're going to see spill over into bridge vectors. That's where they come into uh, play. So that that site is, I believe it's around 1.9 acres total. Can you, can you put it up on the, um, can you share your screen so people can I, see the audience? Yeah, it, it, Carolyn, it won't let me share my screen. It says, oh, dis, it. oh okay, now it. it's allowing me. Okay, let try me it. see. It's up by the north, the, the dry bridge, the swamp up on north, north Main. Yes. Five and 10. All right, let me get it up. Okay, you guys can see that. Yeah. yeah. Oh, John, that's good. Uh, there it is. See that? Okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. That's okay. great. So awesome. Thank you. Thank you very much for your help with that. All right. So the total area is 1.9 acres. It's kind of mixed. There are spots throughout. So I surveyed this area and many others, and so I sampled it to see if it's actually mosquito habitat. Um, and so out of that whole area, there's roughly one acre of mosquito habitat. Okay. So moving on to site two, it's located between Eastern Ave and Crestview Drive. It's approximately 1.2 acres. It's a meadow located behind the church, which is also the senior center um, that is considered a high risk population. Uh, the vector species found in this type of habitat include Aedes vexans, their uh, bridge vector for Tripoli and Oclaritatis canadensis again, uh, bridge vector for Tripoli and West Nile virus. So the third site is located at the end of Kelleher Drive. Uh, it is also a deciduous swamp. Uh, many of them are. The targeted vector species is the same as the first site, Eclaritatus candidensis and Culex salinarius. And that is, uh, the total area is 1.9 acres. Treatment area, what I found to actually be breeding is about 0.75 acres. So the fourth site is, um, it's a stagnant ditch. It's it actually doesn't show up on uh, the wetlands DP layer. Uh, I discovered it by just kind of following the water in that area, the hydrology in that area. And uh, it is a backed up ditch. It's pretty stagnant. So that's conducive to breeding. It does have mosquito larvae in it and it's conducive to breeding Culex pipiens, which is the primary vector for West Nile virus and um, Anopheles punctipennis which is a potential bridge vector for West Nile virus. Um, John, I know um, uh, some of the people that are here are especially interested like in the cross street area. You went and you did sample that water. Is that correct? And it, it, you didn't see anything breeding in there yet? No, I did. I did sample a lot of areas. I'll have to look back at my notes and see if I actually got to cross street. But most of the areas... Some of them were um, flowing. So if you have some flow in the area, mosquitoes are not going to breed there because they're not strong swimmers. So even if it's just a little bit of flow, that's going to draw out the, the mosquito larvae. So they've evolved, you know, throughout the, the you know, eons to, to adapt to uh, areas that are just, you know, stagnant and conducive to their survival. Okay. And um, so then can you just go over the BTI that you'll be using? Sure. So, so the, the, the product overview, the, the product I would be using is very safe. It's four-star BTI CRG. It's a controlled release granule, which means that it will last up to 40 days. It will be effective up to 40 days, um, probably a little more than that. Uh, so what it is, is a naturally occurring soil bacteria that is pretty much harmless to humans and animals. Uh, in BTI, it's Bacillus thuringiensis subspecies is Raleigh-ensis. Um, again, it's pretty, it's pretty low toxicity to uh, mammals and other animals. Um, 
so we're not very concerned about BTI. There are some non-target organisms that literature has suggested that it may affect, and it makes sense. You know, you're looking at how it affects mosquito larvae so that they ingest it. It's it's a spore, and eventually it it turns into a crystallized protein in the gut. And the only way it does that is if the the alkalinity is high enough, the pH level is high enough. And so that's why it doesn't really target too many other non-target organisms or, or other aquatic organisms. Um, the other ones, the, what it's confirmed to be toxic to are buffalo gnats, and, uh, which is also known as black flies, and non-biting midges. Uh, the other issue with it that, you know, we have found is that it does have indirect tropic effects where in an area that is, you know, you have, you have biodiversity that's at a high level and you take away those mosquitoes from there, now you're taking away a food source. So, you know, I really look at these sites from a holistic point of view. Is it an area that is high in biodiversity? If it is, then then it's not a site that is, is um, you know, a site that I would want to treat with BTI. Great. Okay. Um, so, um, John, you said um, it's going to be $2,800.18 for the first treatment. And, and three other and, and you have another treatment for a total of um, $5,612. And 79 cents, right? That's that's correct. And so the first treatment, I really have that down. That's that's a pretty exact estimate, I would say, or accurate estimate, because I've already done the surveying. I, I know which areas are breeding. The the second one, it's a little harder to determine. That's kind of that's a to be determined. So that's something I don't know if you guys would want to, if you want to move forward, if you would like to wait and see. If that's something you'd like to do for like FY25, and we'll see, we can base it on, you know, arbovirus surveillance data and confirmed breeding areas in close proximity to high risk populations. And we can look at that data and information, you know, to make decisions as far as treating. I can't guarantee that it's going to be two acres or it's going to be five sites. It's a little yeah, tough you know to what tell. I'd like to do? Let's do the first day. Yeah, let's yeah. let's vote. Well, let's. I want you to do this treatment as soon as you can, right? Because okay. I know you're going to get busy with trapping and um, testing. So I want I want to make sure that you do this immediately, um, as soon as you can. And then what we'll do. Um, yeah is have you resurvey areas if we have a wet summer we want you to 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 go around and look where the breeding uh larvae is mm -hmm. and then then come back with an estimate okay so, yeah. the, so i mean we we definitely are committing to the second treatment but but we okay. want you to tell we want an accurate yes okay. that's understandable yeah um so I guess I would make a motion that we pay for the twenty eight hundred eighteen cents right. um, immediately, and then commit to a second treatment. But just, just come back with about, tell us what it is. Okay. The, uh, yeah, area that to be treated. All right. Yeah. Based and on and so this will be paid out of Casey Fund four forty one. It's that mosquito money left over from the CDC grant. Um. So. Uh, is there any more discussion? I'll second the motion. All right. Is there any more discussion? No. Well, uh, does anyone have any questions of John? Yeah, Fred. I, uh, John, yes, absolutely. But I can tell you right now that it's not going to happen immediately. So I want this treatment happening immediately so we can. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yes, and we're going to talk about it. Don't worry, <laughs> we're working on it. Okay, so, like some of these areas you can't empty of water, but uh, but certain areas you can. So definitely, we want to treat everywhere, and then yes, address where we can lower that water, get rid of it. I, I just want this to happen, mm -hmm. and also, um, all those in favor first. I, I know, Daniel. 
Yeah. Oh, sorry. Hi, Trevor McDaniel. Hi, Tim Hill. Carolyn Ness. Okay. Sorry. There's just one more item on this. Um, Casey, Kevin is almost out of mosquito drunk dunks to, to treat the catch basins. So, um, I, and I have no Board of Health money left over this year. So we're going to have to use um, his, he's going to get more mosquito dunks so he can keep treating the catch basins out of this money too. Okay. Um, I told him to do that. And as long as you guys, you have no problems yeah, no, with that. No, no, okay. no. Mosquitoes, please. Yeah. Okay. It's going to be a rough year. Well, the, the, we have West Nile. We had West Nile at the tail end of last year. And that's with Kevin even treating the catch basins. And it wasn't so. a whole with this. So, yeah. John, you can stop sharing, I so, think. Yeah. Yep. John, is there anything else you want to add before? Um, uh, and I really appreciate you coming on. I, I just want you to know this is John is our full time superintendent now. He, uh, we're so excited we have a real person that is full time. So uh -oh. The Mosquito District, the Pioneer Valley Mosquito District. Thank you. And he is living over at the 1888 building. Um, we didn't have a place. Not overnight, but you know. Well, <laughs> yeah, and it's he's, he's covering. He's he's making sure our insurance costs are lower for not an abandoned building and covering our costs to um, maintain the building. And um, so he went this winter. He was lovely. He went out and was looking for crypts of these bad mosquitoes, oh. and he's been doing a little extra for us. And I, so I just want to say he's been really fabulous. And so thank you, John, so much. It's my pleasure. Thanks. All right. So uh, please get started. <laughs> oh, will do. I'll get started right away. All right. Thanks, John. Thank you. Okay. Um, next item on the agenda is Eastern Ave regarding ditch maintenance. So the easiest thing to do would be to come up and talk. Say you have, to, inter you have to introduce yourselves into these speakers. They have to. You have to practically eat them. They're they're <laughs> not that that great. But anyway, so that people can hear. So Fred, come on up. My name is Fred Vecta from Eastern Avenue, and I have a number of my neighbors here too. Welcome. Thank you. So I know that in the past, way back, uh, my mother came with a group of people to talk about the ditch on Eastern Avenue, uh, actually both sides, which you know we're only on the north side, but these ditches, from my understanding, were built in the 1930s when the sewer plant or the sewer system was put in, and it's to protect the sewer system from overflows of water going into the storm drains and down. This is what I was told by one of our elder statesmen in town. Um, so this has been an ongoing issue. What it's causing is everyone on Eastern Avenue has water in their cellar. It's been getting worse and worse over the years as the level of the ditch is getting higher and higher. There's a culvert under Cross Street that's 24 inches in diameter. It's got about six inches of it clear. So this has filled up 18 inches. It's raised the water table in the area for everyone on Eastern Avenue and possibly Grave Street too. This year being a lot of rain and you know no place for it to go, people are running their sump pumps constantly. Uh, Linda Rowe next door, she has two pumps in there that are running about every seven minutes. Mm -hmm. People have their possessions on pallets in their cellars. They're running dehumidifiers, mostly senior citizens, and they're now paying twice as much per kilowatt hour as we had been paying for a few years. It, it had been very nice. So this is a big impact on a lot of seniors on that street uh to to have to pay this extra money it's awful um back in the 70s when i was still in high school the level of that ditch was brought back to its original level guy got in there one of cocott's employees with a backhoe and he went the entire length of that ditch and he dug it and he smoothed out the dirt and the water table was lowered my parents didn't have water after that. They had always had water in the cellar. So obviously this is what we need to do 
to get the water out of people's cellars. Now, over the years, the ditch has grown. A lot of people have let trees grow in it. Um, right now, when you had John up here, that water is still flowing. That's not stagnant. That generally will dry up. But until it does, everybody has water in their cellar. It's my understanding from our DPW boss that when the sewer work gets done on Cross Street, that culvert's going to get changed while they have everything dug up. So if you take that culvert, which is now filled 18 inches full of soil, and you put a new one in, the first big rain we get, it's going to fill that culvert up, and you're going to have 18 inch deep by the width of Cross Street full of water, which is our breeding ground. Yes, Trevor. Is there a... Um... I'm just looking at the aerial view of it. Is there a ditch that is on the east side across? Uh, uh, it there's, looks like there's a property. It almost looks like the ditch kind of goes up the hill a little bit. You know what? It, 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 goes, it goes, yes, on the east side of cross. So it goes all the way up Eastern Avenue till it hits the mountain. But right in back of the cross street homes, yeah. it also uh, runs there yeah. over to cross street. And then out in the fields... Uh, in back of, uh, well, behind the street. Linda's. There's there's a lot of ditches out there in those fields that are still being used for farming. Yeah. Um, I don't think there's one that's any closer to Grave Street than being way out in the field, but we've right. got, we actually had another one on the south side of Eastern Avenue, which is kind of filled in over here. That was a narrow one. And that ran, again, from the mountain all yep. the way down and it took a right in between what is now 20 and 22 Eastern Avenue. Okay. And it went under the road in a culvert, and the culvert goes all the way across the vacant lot uh, into this ditch that's on the north side. Yeah. So that's all filled in. So now we have a large lake and carol mcburney over at number 20 she had nice lakefront property for a while <laughs> right but that's not draining so that's another problem these things have not been maintained for a long time yeah. and they're full the you know 100 year flood pond that um crestview had to build 25 i believe well, yeah. well, and, well regardless we, we always heard 100 years and of course look yeah. at the, the floods that we had but regardless yeah. of what it is you know, I've been over helping at the senior center, and that huge lake back there is just growing mosquitoes. Oh, it is. Yeah. That's so, why John's going to treat them. Right. But let's, you know, let's do the smart thing, and let's. we want to get rid of this water. Uh, the, the house at number 22, the group home there, is pumping water into that about every, again, Couple five minutes, to seven yeah. minutes. And, you know, we can't yeah, pump the water about. into, we have a moratorium that we can't put the water into the, right. the your, your, I know, your that was a DP moratorium. So, right, so if we can uh, bring these ditches back to the original level, which we need to do, it's going to solve a ton of problems of everybody on Eastern Avenue, possibly Grave Street, and I know that even Crestview has a lot of problems. And I can't see it being a huge expense. I don't know what our guys have. Well, or, well, yes. well, let, okay. me, let me tell you the situation, where we are, and then what we are doing. Okay, so it is a town deeded ditch, but and it is not, and you are absolutely correct. It has not been maintained since 1985 when the uh, federal government passed the Food Security Act. Um, that allow didn't did not allow us to do any more maintenance on our ditches since 1985 okay so it's and then the other thing is it's extremely extremely challenging to do anything on private property related to getting to the ditch so r roads you know any roads that get covered by silt and water under emergency we can try to get in there okay but as at to date, our roads have not been affected yet. You know, when we did it, when we did digging on private property up in Old Deerfield, you know, across from Richardson's Candy Kitchen to connect with Mill Village, you know, the road was completely covered. 
uh, multiple times. Um, same thing with Wapping Road. We were allowed to do that um, because of the emergency. So what, what happened is um, we received almost $800,000 in July of 21 from the uh, July 21 storms. And we didn't you, Joe and Natalie, again, did a fantastic job. Um, and we had 263,000 left over. And we are using 200 of it towards the road damage of 23, but we had we are setting aside 63,000 for some engineering. It's complicated here because um, the engineers that we've had look at this already, um, the groundwater level, as everybody knows, has gone up. From the 90s, it's gone up 22 inches, okay? The water's just not moving out of the area. Um, accessibility, um, if we're gonna do any work there, we have to um, have everyone sign a release. We went through this with Bloody Brook, trying to do work in there, and you know we had a couple people object. So we have to have a sign release of anyone that is you know near that ditch, that property backing up to the ditch. And then it's a release. There's two different kinds of releases that we are gonna ask people to sign. Either release where we leave the material there in their yards, you know, we'll try to have the contractor like smooth it out a little and that you put con um, conservation mix on it yourself, or we're gonna to have to have carted out. It's not eligible. I mean, I've looked everywhere. It's not eligible for any state removal of the material. So it will be a very expensive project to remove um, all that material out of the ditches um, and off site. Uh, so basically we need to have more data. I know everybody's screaming about, and, I, and I'm so sympathetic. I have so many pictures on my phone of your neighborhoods. And, but we need no, more data as to where, what we are actually gonna do. Um, there's, you, you need to put in the projected rainfall for from 2025 to 2050. You need to take in all the water that's coming off of the mountain and you need to calculate how do you move it out of the area before we decide what we're gonna do. What we've done so far, as we've had this general overview, I've had a quote from the engineers, uh, it, it will be close to $2 million to address the entire area. Um, we've worked with, um, I've worked with a highway rep that was on Homeland Security and the Mass Association of Conservation uh, Commission's executive director who sits with me on the state commission and our conservation commission and we are only the third community in the state that has put together a bundled NOI. So in other words, we have in place, that was a, a done for September of 22. It's, it's places in town, we're gonna do regular maintenance. So we have already set up a bundled NOI, but we have to figure out how we're gonna do this maintenance. Um, so we're ready to add that in. The Mosquito District under John has gone, uh, we have uh, asked to put together this program and John can explain it a little bit more where he can hand dig and go around and hand dig these st stagnant areas. We got signed off from the state reclamation board because we're quasi state, you've got to get all these people's permission and we're waiting on the department of ag. So then John can work with the conservation commission Kevin and the highway department, and and we can do a little hand digging. Um, we've restarted Deerfield 2030 and the yard by yard program and have a healthy soils plan. And the idea is to do all your native plants, suck up water. One of the other aspects that we're looking at is using, trying to get well points in certain areas so that instead of irrigating when we have droughts, like in 22, when people were um, watering their lawns, all that water comes down from the reservoir and, and attributes to, potentially attributes to the extra high water table. So the idea is to have recycled water that's already here and use that for irrigation. And a certain amount of it, of course, evaporates and is lost. So hopefully that would lower the water table. 
I mean, one of the examples is right here at our own baseball field. If we didn't use the water from the coming down in the reservoir and we use water from the water table, eventually you're lowering the water table. So it's all these accumulative things in that program. <clears throat> we toured on April 28th. Um, I got a small grant from the conservation district um, and toured with Nick Miller from Field Geology. He's a fluvio geomorphologist. And I was, he was here for five hours and he couldn't believe how bad it was. And the idea was to get him to help us figure out how to move water, but it's so complicated and so severe that we are now having to do a hydraulic modeling that will predict where the water goes and how it moves and an assessment, a high, high, um, uh, water assessment of the area as to where the water is going. And you can do it at the same time. Um, so we asked, uh, we just applied for the state for, we had $10,750 left over from that grant. So we um, asking to amend that to do this modeling. And Christopher Dunn, as a result of that visit, just put in a MVP grant last Friday, but there's no match because we had suffered such inland, bad inland flooding. So hopefully we'll get that money to do this modeling, hydraulic modeling, as well as the water assessment so that we'll have this information and then we can get grants to do this project completely in, in the whole area. So Fred, um, I just want to say that I was out exactly where you're talking about, the pond that comes from Crestview, the detention pond with John Pachorek when we were touring road damage and road repairs maybe seven days ago. And it looks, I'm not an engineer, but it looks like the culvert there is probably too small. The water doesn't flow through fast enough. And then it flows into some of the ditches you're talking about and the ditches are silted up. And so uh, we definitely need to be able to get in there. So do you have a do you have a sense that the neighbors in the area would be amenable to signing waivers to allow us to, you know, because all the heads are not with a lot of these situations where, hey, we get a heavy storm, maybe we can get a de declaration of emergency. And the, the conservation. Function. I always, I always do a declaration. Believe me. Right, and then we get a situation where, okay, for thirty days we can do some things that we're not normally allowed to do. So I was, it was really an education uh, to go in and see that, and so um, glad your guys are here. You know, yeah. to kick us. I didn't see what Trevor had to say. So just, um, I'm always like work backwards. Where, where so it, it goes under Fishers, right? Somewhere near there. Well, here's the, the funny brook. thing with that whole backwards. with that whole brook cover yep. is from the mountain down to the old fire station. Yep, it's a seasonal brook. Okay, from somewhere around Fishers all the way to the Connecticut the River, it's a full time brook. It just right. appears out of nowhere. I you know never poked around behind Fishers. Right, but yes, it comes and you know they, out of the ground. They they call it the Blacksmith Brook. They also yep. call it Sugarloaf Brook. That's right. And, I see it on the map here. Yep, and it goes follows South Main Street, goes over by BBA, goes to one sixteen, takes a left, and right. runs parallel. And just before uh, the State Highway Barn, it goes underneath and it meanders down across the yeah. River Road at the beginning of Waitley. But it's really River. kind of like from Fisher's towards your way that it's backing up. I mean, the rest of it seems to have capacity, right? Well, it could run. Well, again, I mean, any of these things, we, we've gotten so much silt down from the mountain over some of these bigger sure. storms. But again, since the yeah. 70s, when I was a teenager, that's the last time that yeah. a, a backhoe was in there bringing this thing back down to its level. And the man just took up a couple of scoops. He put it right. on the north side. He smoothed it out. Right. And he went from the mountain all the way down to the fire station. Yeah. They were supposed to do this a number of years ago, but there was one resident close to the fire station who says, you're not coming through here oh. uh, because he had bees. Well, he's no longer there, so he's okay. not an issue. Now, yeah. the other thing is, as I recall, in our property deed, it says that the town has a legal right of way down through there, which is why okay. I'm here. So if the town yeah. has the right of way, it's because I feel that 
they need to maintain. It's it. needed it. Yeah. So okay. again, this eighteen right. inches they... of of you know raising this water table eighteen yeah. inches is just killing all of us. Right. And it's and DEP is saying no, we can't go in there. Right. But well, the fight. federal government said you can't do this since nineteen eighty five. Like you said, it was deeded from the thirties and the and and night, you know for the sewer. <laughs> I like you. But that's but this is why. You do all this pre-planning, so when you have the opportunity and it comes, you can jump on it, and, and we know what we're going to do. So all this work that's happening doesn't mean that we don't get it done. And I will just let you yeah. go ahead. Okay, I'm, I'm Vic Warrius. I live I'm on Eastern Avenue, Welcome. corner of Eastern Avenue. I've been here before, and yeah. I'm going to mention that, that culvert. The thing is, uh, if you do it, and if you, I, I know myself, we have always maintained that area, but it's getting, and I remember when that was done, I wasn't living here at the time, but I was yeah. mowing the lawn for my father or the yeah. ditch because yeah. it was a pain. Okay. Right. The, the guy, and if you, if you do a good job and, 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 and do the ditch and oh. then uh, I know myself, I maintain it there, but I, down below it has the trees have grown and so forth. The other thing is the sediment. The sediment is is backing up right now. It's holding water back, and there'll be when the the ditch is dried. There still will be water in back of that in the culvert and out in front of it. The catch basins from the upper, from above Cross Street, above Eastern yep. Avenue, they go into a, a culvert. I think it's an eighteen inch culvert, but I'm not positive. Yeah, but it's very it, right now. It is totally under the silt. Uh -oh. uh, and it, it does. There is some flowing, but it all the sediment is is uh, really it, it's it doesn't flow enough to move the sediment. So right. consequently, anything like when the trees and when uh, different things back it up. I mean, I can remember as a kid building dams in the ditch yeah. when it would flow. <laughs> you know, we were bad, but uh, <laughs> the, the point is, Who knew? Uh, and I was I was 20 when he was a teenager. <laughs> but uh, the, the other thing is too, anything you do, do it soon because I'm going to, I'm not going to hire it. people to go and move the sediment and I can do it now, but I don't yeah. know. About you know what? I, I didn't, um, I don't mean to interrupt, but Kevin is on and I didn't see his hand up. So Kevin, would you like to address a little bit of this? Sure, certainly. Um, I mean, everything they're saying so far is 100% correct. Um, you know, the town does it, the town does have a deeded way through there for that. Um, it is the town's responsibility. Um, we are in the process of trying to get that as part of our bundled NOI, so that way we don't have to wait for an event and or other hoops that you would have to jump through to make it happen at that point in time. Um, when it comes down to, and, and I'm just going to kind of jump down, Fred was right. There was one person that was making it extremely difficult because they tried to do some clean out at one point in time. And, and the guy said, there's no way you're going to get in there. Um, they are no longer there. So I don't think that's going to be part of an issue. Um, just real quick, when it does jump over and you see it go, it comes underneath uh, uh, Fisher's, that is all of the uh, road drainage or the catch basins right there, right around the common. That's where all that goes and dumps into that. Now, when you, everybody always knows that the, the, the fountain always runs all right. the time, you know, it's not recirculating. Right. That actually goes into that catch basin right there where we usually plow, uh, plow snow. And that in turn goes into uh, the Blackstone or the yeah black, blacksmith blacksmith yeah on um, i would this would be my recommendation is is if we can get this part of the bundle then oi um which i don't think would be too much of an issue it may take a little bit of time to get it but i think it would be a lot shorter time than trying to be able to wait for another way of getting it done um but like carolyn says the big thing is is if we can go in there and just Cut the ditch back down, take the 20 inches out, 22 inches, whatever the original elevations were, bring it down to that. But we can't haul the material out. It has to go on the sides. And whoever's doing the work, you know, we tell them, do a really good job, make it 50 50 all the way across. That way, nobody's getting more than somebody else um, on their property. That won't take that long to do. But like Carolyn said, if we have to go ahead and try and haul it back and forth, because I'll be honest with you, you know, 
as soon as you go ahead and you drive across somebody's lawn, the light bulb in the refrigerator doesn't work anymore. So uh, um, I'm trying to avoid that for the liabilities of the town. I mean, granted, we do have mats that we can put down and drive across as long as we've got a, uh, a decent right of entry because crossing in from the street to the stream, we that is not our entry. Our entry is, is feasibly right down the middle of Brook. So we can, that's, that is where our legality is. We can drive right down the middle of the brook and we don't have to ask for permission for anybody, oh but, but we have to ask permission to be able to make sure that people are okay with putting the material on both sides. And if they're okay with that. You get everybody signed off on. I don't see where it, it, it spreads right. It's going to help. You know, there's just no doubt about it. How many trees are, are growing in the ditch? Like, I mean, I know uh, there's quite a few. I was just looking at that in a, on an overview. I mean, that um, that, would that be okay for people? And well, well, again, I mean, the, the, the town's got the right of way through there and it's, yep. it's to maintain the, the depth of that ditch. Right. So, and again, everybody on that street Trevor, all has wanting. water. So I don't think anybody's going to complain about a, a tree. All right. I realize that's going to take a little bit more work when they did it in the 70s. And there were no trees. Right, right. We used to ride our snowmobiles all the way down there because it was it was open. clear, it was wide open. Right. And right. over the years, that's people were cleaning it out. Stuff right. up. Just just remember that where there's trees, there's roots. Yeah. And, and that so becomes the problem when you try to, to do the uh, the ditch and mm -hmm. yep. level ditch. Um, so, right, right. right now, no. And you have to get rid of those roots. <laughs> Vic's property is right at the cross street uh, color. Okay. If you've got a smaller machine, I, I don't know what you know Kevin would want to try to use for that. If it was to be a mini excavator, full size mini, but also mini. On what we try to get other in side um, of, of uh, the ditch. There are two lots there. One has been sold for a building lot. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. not going to have grass on it. I would quite imagine that, that the the person who bought the lot would have no problem with them driving an excavator or something over mm -hmm. that i mean construction hasn't even started so it's still basically right. it was you know it was it was a pumpkin field last year so yeah so i can see i'm, I'm sure that with uh, you know just say hey can we do this and it's going to take care of some of your water problem they're going to say well, well, of course yeah right and, and that'll also help out that one on on 22 eastern ave where where you've got the the detention area from Crestview, which was required to be put in for that for them to have the condominium, whatever you want to call it, the all the buildings that between Eastern Ave and going through um, yeah, two. it is the wheat, the wet. I'm gonna. I'm sorry. I'm killing their name. Um. But, anyway, that goes right through their property. There is presently a pipe that goes across. I was talking with Ralph Healy about it, and allegedly the, the stories that he was told by Upton was was the people that originally owned that area right there didn't want a very big pipe put in their lawn, so they only required they only allowed a small pipe. Um. I'll be honest with you. I do not know what the size of the pipe is, but regardless of whatever the size it is. It's backing up because it's got nowhere to go. And once again, we're going to go back to if you clean that whole ditch line out all the way down to the fire department, I do believe you're going to alleviate a lot of your problems there on 22 uh, Eastern Ave also with that big area that right now is behind the senior center, which is obviously giving you the, the mosquito issues. Mm. Kevin, I talked to that building owner two days ago. Yeah. And he's for whatever needs to be done. He's got, right. a, uh, you know, six months old that... He wants to be able to play out in the yard without her getting chewed on by mosquitoes. Yeah. Okay, so that's the one that's right across from number twenty-two. Because I haven't approached anybody yeah. to be honest. Yep, it's it's the yellow house on the left. Yep. Uh, right across from Carol McBurney. Yep. So it's actually across from number twenty, uh, where Carol McBurney lives. It's it's the yellow house. Yeah. Well, yeah, it's number nineteen because I'm looking at. A, I, I just happen to be looking at GIS right now. So yeah, it's, it's house number nineteen. Chris, Chris Harris has his hand up. Oh yeah, Chris. Yeah, so you you know I have a long history with Eastern Avenue, and um, I bought the property at 13 Eastern Avenue in uh, in late um, 2018. The first thing I did was go out, take down the hedges near the near the near the ditch, because they were worthless, 
And um, at the same time we did that, we cleared manually at that point, the ditch, and we took any trees out of that ditch. Because I knew as a kid, that's the way it was. That's the way we maintained it. I mean, we used to have ice hockey rinks out there. There used to be flows of water that were natural there with fish in them. Hmm. And um, all that went away because everything got um, uh, ignored and, and it was never maintained again. So everything that this discussion has had is totally true. And um, I think the possible solutions that Kevin is presenting are totally on. But I did mine right away. That was the first thing I did. So uh, maybe it will be, you know, with the... Um... It's funny, Chris, you look on the overview. I was just looking at it and you're right. Your area is one of the clearest areas besides yeah. behind like where yeah. Fred's house. With the neighborhood outreach that you have, maybe you could, you know, if you want to get together and we could work on a release thing just so we could yep. start getting, we know that everybody's property sure. is here and everybody said, yep, go ahead and smooth out what you have. And then we could work on costs and just try to get well, an idea trying, of what this yeah. would be for long term and see if the town will fund it to get it done. Ah. And it's certainly, um, as as Kevin's mentioned, a bundled notice of intent, which is this conservation, you know, law, so that every, you know, we, we can do something, have it last for three years, renew it every three years, and regular maintenance is a lot cheaper than mm. doing trying to do 40 years at one time. So sure. um, I think Kevin is to be applauded for coming up with that idea and uh, the conservation commission's been very receptive um, the conservation commission has been really nice so, they were a little leery because we're only the third community in the state that's doing this but yeah. it's got to happen everywhere I know. It's like if, this. if there's any way anytime soon that something can be done to try to get that uh, pipe well uh, 22 uh, somehow Cleaned out a little bit. Get the guy with and the twenty-two big is the one closest to Sugarloaf Street. Is that the idea? Or no, oh, twenty-two. Oh, is... oh, okay, yeah, yeah. I, I understand what you're saying, Fred. Yeah, I'll I'll see if we can get the jetter down there, yeah. and see if we can jet it out because it'll be on the north side of Eastern Ave. There's that catch basin. Right now, it's it's completely filled with water. Yeah. On so we'll end up probably flooding that area out when we do when we do do it because obviously we're we're introducing more water to try and flush the pipe. Well, um. We'll see what happens and not only that, but it'll give us a real good idea of exactly where it's coming out too. That's on the cross end or the other? No, the oh. the one that what he's talking about is from that retention pond. Oh, or oh yeah, that's over, that's over. small. I think Chris can tell you too that when we were kids and we tried to crawl through there, that one is is pretty tiny. Yeah, it's pretty small. <laughs> All right. Well, we're committed. I I had a conservation board meeting yesterday, and we sent that amendment request in, and I and I hope it gets approved in the next day or two. Okay. And that and Nick Miller was at the meeting, and he um, said that he was working with um, GZA because they're working. They're they have engineering firm. Yes, they they have all kinds of um, other commitments in the area in Conway and different areas. So they're going to get it done for us. Nick promised that he was going to work with us. So, um, I mean, he just was appalled uh, when I took him around and I did talk to neighbors in the area. And so um, these large, you know, it's the, you're trying to, you have to figure out how the flow is because Crestview changed. That was a receiving area from the mountain. And when it got developed, it pushed all the water into other areas. And so you have to have a whole, uh, you know, yes, you can clean out the ditch, but is it really going to carry the water away? And that what you need to do is do all these things together at one time. So we'll start. The Conservation Commission has been lovely. We've worked through all the damages of 23, 21, and now 23. And so, you know, they're they're used to working with us in the sense that, you know, we have desperate situations. All the unintended consequences of large government passing a Food Security Act that will cause 20 years or 30 years, 40 years of issues. Of, so, yeah, I know. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, you know, we have, lost. we have riverfront area. We have bordering or isolated, um, you know, buffer zones. We have, you know, there's so many regulations that we have to worry about and comply. And if 
you know, we have an event where there's an emergency, you can work with the commission and do a little bit more. So the, the, the idea is to be poised to do something, but also to have a complete plan. So if we don't have an event, that doesn't mean we can't try to take care of it because it's terrible. Mm -hmm. And I certainly have, like I said, so many pictures and I know how awful it is. So I feel really bad. I guess one good thing about this particular ditch is because it's more or less a seasonal ditch. We, you know, we're not going to have to worry about upsetting any of the salamanders or exactly. frogs because we don't have them there. Right. You know, this thing, it but, dries out. you know, for, for weeks and weeks and weeks now, everybody's uh, been having so much mm -hmm. water and, yeah. you know, I just feel badly for everybody running those sump pumps and paying I know. the nose. Well, you know, mine runs every 10 minutes. Dumping out yeah. on the deck. Oh, yeah, I know. Minutes. Dumping it into my yard. Right. <laughs> no. So, so Kevin, I just it had a question. I had a question for you, Kevin. So, yes, uh, obviously, we can't make put in a bigger culvert with, without the other work being done. So, we would need to work backwards from the direction of flow to open up the channel till we got to the culvert, and then who knows if we'd be able to replace it immediately. But at least you'd have a channel where the water can go. And it's one on Cross Street. There were there seemed to be ditches all over the place to me, but I uh, you know I didn't live, right. so, live in that area. So so there so there's a culvert or a pipe that goes underneath Cross Street, which is basically closer to the the beginning of the water heading mm -hmm. downstream. Um, obviously the best thing to do would be to start at the fire station, work your way back. Yeah, um, exactly. But the sewer project. When when they when they open up the road instead of us opening up the road twice, right? When they start that, um, that's actually why we just I just finished my last thing with Concom to allow us to go ahead and and replace that pipe and the head walls on both sides. We were going to see if we can try and increase the size of it, you know, but like like Fred says, part of the problem is, is we can go ahead and we can put a bigger pipe in there. I mean, you know, we clean out the north end of it so that way, or excuse me, the upstream side, so it won't, the pipe itself won't fill up, but it's going to back up because it's got 18 inches of debris that it's going to still have in front of it, you know, so that it's going to be trying to push against. So uh, unfortunately, I, I I can almost guarantee you we're not going to be able to get that thing cleared or clean before um, we get that pipe replaced. But uh I don't think really think we want to go ahead and be ripping up the road twice at the same no, time because no, no. because once that. once once we the contract is is like that close to being able or excuse me the bid packet is very close to being put out for the sewer once that's done um it's not going to take them very long you got 300 feet one way 600 feet another way if it takes them that long to do six you know uh, 900 feet um and then after that then we're milling down two inches, replacing an inch and a half of asphalt on Eastern Grays and Cross with a new crosswalk on Graves. Right. The, That'll be and nice. the money, the monies are already set off to the side through chapter 90 for the milling and, and the pavement. So I don't have to worry about not having money for that. That's already been approved. Um, the money has already been allocated or is, is going to be allocated for uh, the project. So it's, it's not going to be a deal of, well, we can't do it because we don't have the money. Those two things, we have the money or I have the money in place. Um, I've already bought the pipe. Uh, the pipe is basically sitting in our backyard just waiting for the opportunity to go ahead and throw it on the ground. Um, any questions on the nope. sewer or well, roadway? Kevin, you know what would be really helpful if, if you could just think of the culvert replacements as a priority, which culverts you... We'll get the information from Nick, but... What I would like, because of, you know, if we're going to do this in a non-emergency, so, you, you know, you have the Wetlands Protection Act, you got to file all these permits for. So Which were already done. Oh, the, so the, all, all, all of that should, D, project, DPC should have taken have care of all that for us. Okay, perfect, perfect. That is, that is done, which is what we're, that we're Okay. Doing. So then would you just prioritize the culverts so that we could make sure that we get them done depending on the money? Okay. Oh, and we'll find the money somewhere. I mean, we really are searching for money. And and like I said, the um, Christopher just filed a MVP grant request where there's no match on Friday. 
uh, there was a deadline because uh, he needed a letter of support from a conservation district. So I got that in with him. So I know he filed that. And then if we have a little seed pot of money from, you know, um, we get approval from the state to change that money around a little, that will help. And because what you're doing is all these permitting costs and all these different things you have to do is 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 what costs money. Um, if we have an event in the meantime, we're, we'll be ready to go. Um, and the idea is always to have a plan so that you can act when we have the opportunity. But letters from people be awesome. Yeah. Just, hey, I live at this. So you map. want me to draft a letter and if, get everybody to sign it? And if you want. Yeah, it, love, it really that would be helpful. It, we it, love it, residents of uh, participation. Uh, you know what? It helps. It'll probably story. be easier than putting the cake together. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but not as anywhere not near as much fun. But, uh, <laughs> okay. So, well, all right, I will work on that. And so at least you know, if you talk with the neighbors or whatever, just if we had a map, it said all these people. There's a star on this one. They're good with it. Here's their signature. Because yeah, you know, I've there. talked to a few people on the yeah. street, and especially around. You know, For sure. Around. I really appreciate you all coming in. I know it's yeah. so awful. I've I've really been trying to figure out what to do and how we're going to pay for it. And thank you. All right. So thank you. Thank, thank you for coming in. Thank you all. Be in touch. Yeah. All right. Appreciate it. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. All right. Public um, Oh, that's relate for the other. You know what? I can't. I, that angle, I can't really. See. I know. Oh, okay. okay. Just a little bit, just in case someone raised the, their hand. You know, so many people were. So oh, I know. There. I know. I know. Um. I'm sorry, we're a little late. Um, so why don't you call come on up? Um, we're, we're talking about uh, land conservation restrictions at the, this moment. I'm I'm so excited about this. I was, you know, was in in the first part of this, so I was really very happy. So hi. Hi, you got to introduce yourself. I am uh, Lane Peteroy, conservation director at the Franklin Land Trust. Mike Antonellis, Antonellis Farm. John Davis, Historic Deerfield. Well, thank you John. so much. See you. Okay, so thank you all. Um, so my new fact of the day is mosquitoes are not good swimmers. I know that. It's good to know. <laughs> um, so we are here because um, the Franklin Land Trust has been working with Mike and Historic Deerfield to conserve um, their properties in the North Meadow, and Mike has. Um, 23 parcels, 165 acres, just surveyed. And um, Historic Deerfield will have about 48 acres, mm -hmm. um, six parcels, mostly five, but there's a little smidge that counts as a six, sixth. Um, so we've been working with them to draft um, conservation restrictions to conserve their lands for agricultural use, watershed um, protection, wildlife habitat, scenic, and historic um, and we did a whole lot of fundraising in between so we've been in this process for for three years the conservation restriction that I have shared with all of you um, for each project outlines what they can and cannot do on the property so they can't build more unless they've asked for it um, they can't put houses on it um, what they can do is agriculture uh, forestry, um, wildlife habitat, trails if they wanted, but it is going to protect these lands for the uses that are currently in place. Um, with everybody's signatures, so the CR is back. It has been final approval with the Department of Conservation Services, which was no small feat. Um, they're very, very, very backed up. Um, so it's been a little bit tight in terms of getting this done. Um, our executive director has now signed the restriction. All the attorneys, everyone has uh, historic Deerfield, Franklin Land Trust, and all the state attorneys. Part of the process is that um, we ask the town to vote to support these two conservation restrictions and then sign it as their approval. That makes it statutory. So these documents will last forever and not expire and they will travel with the properties. So that's kind of the gist. Um, Mike's land is 100% is prime farmland. Um, the historic Deerfield, except for the small, my moon-shaped piece at the mm -hmm. bottom of Mill no Village, way. is also prime farmland. 
The one um, in yellow? Yes, the one in yellow. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I don't know if either of you have would like to say anything and then we can have questions or whatever you would like. Well, I, I just had a quick question. Yes. Um, are we going to be, I think in the past on some of the restrictions that have been put in place, APRs, is this different? This is different. So mm -hmm. um, this is a conservation restriction, but it has very strong agricultural language in yeah, it. Excellent. Yeah. Yes. And so that was just the process that, that both of the landowners wish to go what, through. What happened is, is, is unfortunately the APR system doesn't uh, appreciate the prime soils that are flood related. So um, Franklin Land Trust has gone out and raised enough money that um, it was worth putting out under restriction basically. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Otherwise, poor Mike would have gotten hardly any money for the prime farming. <laughs> no. That's why we're not using the APR system. It is 100% floodplain. So, yes. so yes. I know. And that's why they it, can't, it, it makes the APR is restricted, restricted. Yes. They can't do, do it. So yeah. having you raise the uh, money so that we could put this lovely land that has been farmed for right. generations under protection is fabulous. And Historic Deerfield, they're donating the restriction. We raise money for all the due diligence, all the, mm -hmm. all the yeah. process. So that's wonderful. Yeah, and all the parcels Thank were you, surveyed, the ones, you know, so all the mics yeah. were surveyed, the title, yeah. everything was cleared up. And so the pins are already gone um, for the most of them. Um, but yeah, so we're looking actually to close these before the end of the month because some grant funding that we got has been... Um, they've actually given us two extensions because we haven't been able to get this done. So. Well, I will make the motion that we support this project. Two? I, two projects I, and I, restrictions. I'll second the motion just to say that um, the, these properties absolutely belong in conservation, right? It's farming and it's such a beautiful spot um, and it needs to stay that way. It's the best soil probably in the world um, top five percent and um you know but all but just on my little soapbox here we're also putting so much land in conservation and restriction that we have nowhere to build really and just had a weekend you know summit uh talking about affordable housing and nowhere to build and housing is so expensive and we have no place no land because everything's trapped up so um, not this land. This land is for farming. This it's land is built. beautiful, can't be built on. It's not designed there, but I always just like to take take a second to stand by so and I see, say we totally, need housing. We do understand that. We, and, we're you know, struggling we, with I, that. And we, you know, we're I'm going to stand on my soapbox and say <laughs> our zoning doesn't allow for dense. Bingo. So Bingo. We've, we've got an opportunity with a property that was um, leased by Yankee Candle where there's already corporate offices. Yep. There's already infrastructure there. Yep. If we could go do some like a 40 hour project there that's right. very dense, Perfect. High, you know, uh, yeah. mixed use stuff yep. there. Yeah. Um, that's, that's the lots point. of yeah. housing. Yeah. Because the state, everywhere in the country, it's the same problem. It yeah. is. And there are corporations that are buying up hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of houses yes. to rent to people at twice what they should be renting them at. Yes. So these problems are not unique to Deerfield. They That's are true. not unique. And and I would say, you know, many of the lands and, you know, so Mike is under Chapter 61. Yeah. A, so his tax base won't change. Right. That's a floodplain. So it's true. No it's building. Totally but we perfect. totally, we work all the time and, and many times with landowners. Well, I would say always, I always try to balance. Um, do you want to keep a few house lots out and protect this? Right. Do you want to, you know, and a lot yeah. of folks do because yeah. maybe their kids might want sure. it or maybe they just need that, you know, income that, you know, right. and so we, we do try to balance that. Thank you. Appreciate um, that. But we are trying to really work on farming. This, this is just prime property. It's it so is. Beautiful. It's fabulous. And I, I can't thank you enough, really, for the effort. Because yeah. what this does is allow Mike to stay in business. Yeah. Really. It's awesome. So we're, we're really supportive of this. Absolutely. So I think, I think I think it might be really good. I know I'm interrupting your motion, but to hear from Mike and to, from John also. I was just briefly. To point out that John's <laughs> been very patient going to the mic and stopping. <laughs> so John, please. No, I just wanted to say how grateful we are that you can support this. It's mm -hmm. very much a part of what our mission is to talk about agricultural history and the really unique 
layout of the North and South Meadows and the street in Old Deerfield. And, um, and I should say that um, we pay taxes on this acreage that we lease to farmers and we will continue to pay taxes even Thank after you. this restriction. So there'll be no change in that. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you, John. Very grateful. <clears throat> Uh, yeah, we also appreciate uh, appreciate the support from everybody and everything that the uh, land trust has done to make all this possible as well. Yeah, I mean it's been a long three long haul three years. <laughs> everything going it's been on. Pretty it's stressful. And, yeah. Yeah. So we're happy to finally see the end here, and yep. uh, we yep. appreciate your su the support on all. Yeah. This. Will it's will you will guys. you be able, Michael, to like build a like replace a barn or? We have, that sort of thing. yeah, we have certain clauses in there that still allows us um, to repair barns and stuff like yeah. that. We have an yeah. envelope and some higher elevation stuff if we ever wanted to put new barns. And, okay, but Good. there's a lot of different stuff that we uh, went back and forth on with greenhouses and what we sure. were doing stuff like that out there. Yeah, right. So it's, That's it's great. pretty open. It's it's flexible for agriculture. And they're more, the conservation restrictions are a little more user friendly than. Uh, APRs in general yeah. because there's not federal and state monies. Yeah, right. Know, that is, you know, so this is kind of a, a little bit of a uh, a movement by mm -hmm. you know the using these restrictions for farmland as opposed to just for a forest. Right. Right. Yeah. It's great. It's great. So we've seconded it, right? Uh, yeah. yes. yes. All those in favor? Tim LG, aye. Trevor McDaniel, aye. Carolyn Ness, aye. Thank you so much. I, I really appreciate everything and everyone's efforts. Thank it, you, Don. And so did you fine. draft us a letter? I, well, yeah. Uh, the conservation restrictions. I am a notary or Casey, are you a notary? Yes, I am too. So I can I have the pages and okay. for each one. And that would be lovely if we can do it. Yeah, let's do it. Yes, let's, let's just get do it done. I'm gonna steal your your signature as well. I don't I have your page. Signing yeah. ceremony. <laughs> Yes, okay. but let me give you if you want. I have a baby. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. So that the things are what I'm saying. I'm 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 really thankful for all your efforts and I'm sorry it seemed like we were Doing phone no, tags no, for a while. Literally page, so you will get those in this, right? Give me some other one. Oh, this is great. We'll get this done right away. Perfect. You want a folder to hold them in, or not? And how's this for efficiency? Signing, notarizing, all in one. And then, um, so I will come and pick those up next week. So here, I can. Um, well, you can do Mike too, or I can do you, Mike, whichever works. Here, Carolyn, you, uh, Casey, you want to do these? Thank you. Thanks Thank so you, much. John. Thank you, you so you. much again. Thanks for supporting um, the opening. Um, and Mike, you thanks. Mike. <laughs> okay, next item on the agenda is hydrology model update. Um, like I said, um, I, we're hoping to get permission from the state to redirect some of that grant money. Um, and Nick Miller had, was supposed to get me a quote for the meeting tonight, but I don't have a quote. But it will generally be in the $40,000 range. So that was why Chris... Um, done had put in uh, the MVP application. Okay. And again, there's no match, but if there was, we could use um, conservation district match money. The board was fine with supporting that. Um, and we are, the, and the board is also was a fine supporting the change of use for the FY24. Um, you know, we're doing more follow-up on Bloody Brook. So, because mm -hmm. cause it's a, uh, geomorphic um, assessment that you want to do at the same time that you're doing the hydraulic assessment. 
And so hopefully we can get that done at a cheaper rate mm -hmm. because we're doing it together. But I don't okay. have a price, so it will just have to go on to the next um, meeting agenda, if that's okay. Yeah. All right. Um, next item on the agenda. Well, I have an update. Oh, if sure. I'm uh, just waiting for Tim to sit, and then we'll I just want to give an update on the sewer. Oh, okay. Um, so we're gonna skip. We're gonna skip uh, to unanticipated. You know what we could do? But can we do the time capsule first? Can, can I just oh. do a quick select board update? Yep. Oh, oh, all right. All right. If you want to do that. On. Yeah. Um, okay. So I just want to give everyone an update that this, we had our last uh, sewer construction meeting at the plant today because the uh, substantial completion is next week and the uh, full completion of the job is the end of the end of May. So uh, there's uh, punch list stuff to do, but I think pretty much everything is set at the plant. They have um, a couple more things to finish out this month, and they're really cleaning out everything. So they're they're pretty much done. And um, Bob Walden gave the uh, walkthrough inspection of the property. He's just waiting on the financial uh, final architectural drawings and uh, completed work. Uh, then he'll he'll sign off on that. So. Um, our sewer project is very close to finished um, and it is done on budget. So, and on time, the, um, the other thing that I want to mention, which is kind of distressing is the effluent pump leading out of the plant showed Tim today. Um, it is, uh, it is falling apart. So completely broken in half. And uh, I think with the flooding in our March storms and the river was so high, um, the whole embankment is starting to go. So, uh, I talked with DPC about getting a camera through there to see how the, what the condition of the pipe is. And then also we need to kind of lean on your expertise on basement <laughs> sliding away yeah. uh, and try to figure out where we go from here. And um, Did you get, um, did, were they able to get any camera up there? I got a camera on it all. I sent some, I have. I, a, no, no, a, you sent me the thing, but I. They they're gonna, not going to run a camera until they can. Uh, stop the flow because you got to stop the okay. flow of the river. So we have to put that in the into the uh, aeration tanks and fill those up for about an hour while we run cameras through. But DPC is wants a request from us to do that. So he said he would run the cameras through the pipe that's there, but the whole rest of the pipe, half of it's gone, and the it's just eroding. The I tank. know, but okay, so. Uh... I'm, I'll make a motion that we authorize the camera look because right. we gotta, we we'll gotta never get a, what's going on. I was just going to say, we can't, we can't do anything until we know how much is, how far back we have to go. Okay. Right. So is there a second for that? Second. All those in favor? Chairman McDaniel, aye. Carolyn Ness, aye. Okay. I'll let him know to get started what, on that. What I, um, there's two things that we can do immediately. I, I, um, Darren never called me back before, um, the meeting started, but I left a message for Darren Davis, um, the state engineer at NRCS, and he um, hopefully can come out and look at it tomorrow. That'd be great. I told him it. Um, uh, what I did is go back. You know all our um, rain gauge. Range gauge, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So this just to make sure we agree. Um, the we're gonna pick the event as April twelfth when you on your rain gauge was four and three quarters mm -hmm. um tim had a look had like 4.6 and mine was like 4.4 .4 inches yeah um but you're the closest one to the sewer yeah plants. the river's just been so high yeah and it's so we're going to use that rubbish. is the date and then we're going to use the March 23rd storm mm -hmm. and the March 10th storm mm -hmm. um, where we were all over four inches again yeah. um, as, as uh, creating the damages. So mm -hmm. from December 18th. Right. But the reason why it's a very important and you guys agree is that we're going to use the April 12th storm because you have 60 days from April 12th to get the application in. Yeah. So if Darren comes out far. and looks at the bank, I I don't know offhand how much uh how how much footage we're talking about, but it looked from your pictures. Well, I would say, I mean, from 
where the waterfall is now yeah. for the river is probably 50 feet. And then we'll probably have to go back can, into the yeah, bank. Probably 100 feet back the other yeah. way. Yeah. Okay. And then, and then how, how long on the bank of the river? I would say it's probably, it's not, it's probably half the width of this room, do you say? Maybe. Uh, yeah. I mean, if, are you, okay. do you think like. I mean, if you had to, yeah, from, from that wall, the steps to probably. You, Tim, is about where the um, yeah. If you or if maybe you the Casey secured the embankment on both sides and then went back towards the sewer plant. That whole area needs to get done. Yeah. It's not a hundred feet, but it's, no. um, it's yeah, in width. Are you talking? Are you talking bank width? Are you, are you talking trying to stay underneath the hundred feet? The length of the have, bank. have you seen it yet, Kevin? Yeah, I, I Eric called me this afternoon, and right. and I as soon as he did, I went right down and I took a peek yeah. at it. Yeah. Um, yeah, you're right. The embankment is is pretty much shot on, um, again, like you, it was, it was the river came up that high and it took yeah. it out. Yeah. Um, so you've got that one drain that goes over there, uh, that that's just regular yard drain. That's and right. That, that head wall has collapsed. Yeah. Now you've got your effluent uh, pipe coming out. Um, the head wall is failed. Um, yeah. it drops down into a hole. Yeah. Somehow or other, the water's going backwards no and no actually it's going it's going into something there because yeah. if you actually yeah. look in the water about 10 feet out yeah you yeah. can see the water coming up you can see it bubbling oh okay well so it, yeah it must be going somewhere. there's some it sort of like void going the water up. swirls around and, and goes down and then it works its way back yeah. Yeah. so uh, optimistically we're not getting away with less than a half a million uh, oh i have no idea what no, number no we're idea. talking Half a mil was a thought that just came into my head when I was yeah. thinking earlier, but it, no it's, it's all going to depend on what, what you're going to get stuck with for, for. Well, okay. Um, so, but this is the reason why I'm, yeah, I'm going there's, to there's a lot of background million with Joe and Natalie. Okay. And say it potentially could be more when we get it's more information. More. All right. Yeah. Um, because this is, we're going to attribute this to, you know, our storm damage. Well, it's, yeah. Yeah, because this has been Quite happening fast. over time because this is one of the things that we took off the sewer right. plans because we couldn't afford it. Yeah. So we're going to, you know, this, I'm, and it, and it huge, fell apart. Know. I know, and it fell apart. It didn't look like it was going to fall apart for no, a while, but we've had, know. it's gone. Right. And it's all these storms. So, okay. So I called Darren. He's coming out to look at it and Darren, from the EWP program. Yeah, and that'll be the if he can question. just make sure he gets in contact with Eric, so a he knows he's on property, and b yeah, he can right. actually get him through the gate, oh, which yeah. would be easier. Would Absolutely, yeah. Darren and wouldn't you. come unless he could meet with you guys. Yeah, right. Um, yeah. But I'm hoping he'll call me back pretty soon. It was just at the end of the day, mm -hmm. nothing. Yep. Um, and then I'm gonna call, uh, write an email to uh, to Joe and Natalie and tell them that you know not only are we short six hundred thousand mm -hmm. from the road repairs just to stabilize right and we have a few more roads to fix plus now we got this damage on right of it. so um you know we want that second payout if we yeah can. all right sure. okay I, I, otherwise i'm not really sure you know what money i mean we could We're do gonna this have to just evaluate what's it going to yeah. cost to do i mean christopher christopher dunn's on them but I'm I'm not sure this will not qualify for three three nineteen. I do not believe Christopher will will it, and and also I don't see this as an MVP at this point. Although we could maybe squeeze it in under MVP if if we're upgrading some kind of climate resiliency. I don't know. We'd have to look at that. See it. Um, and that okay, and so we, We'll tell Dave we can do the camera work and work yeah. with Eric to stop the flow and then get the camera in, see where we're at. I don't know how you, I mean, you just got to write off the rest of the pipe all the way out. It's just gone. Yeah, correct. Not like you can run a camera through it. There's nothing. Yeah, yeah. it's good. Yeah. Because yeah. right. you, you see that second sinkhole, that, that huge sinkhole yeah. that's right next to it. Exactly. You know, and that's all in line with the pipe. So Right. Um, it's, it's broken in several places then. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. I just right. want to bring you guys up to speed yeah. on what we found today, and mm -hmm. yeah, always fun. Never, well, never thank you, moment. Trevor. I know uh, it is really depressing. Of course, I have to say I know it's bad, but <laughs> when I first heard you talk about it, and then when I saw it, I said, "Well, 
That's only a 12 inch pipe. I know. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's but not a 48 inch pipe, but is this a 48? No, no. So hopefully that's a good thing. Well, I don't know. Uh, yeah. It doesn't matter. It's, it's all difficult. the permitting and all the it other stuff. It does need stuff. to be bigger anyways. But, it, it does need yeah. to be bigger, but oh. All right. Anyway, so, so next done. item, next item on the agenda is time capsule placement. Oh, right. So Chris, uh, change number one is June 8th now and not May 11th. Oh, Okay. Yeah, so let, let me just go step through really quickly. <clears throat> so the latest concept is Plan A was near Bloody Brook Monument in um, conjunction with other enhancements to Bloody Brook Monument Park. But that's complicated by the possibility of artifacts um, buried on the site and uh, lots of permits and time delays, et cetera. So Plan B is to put the time capsule in front of the 1821 Congregational Church at the northwest juncture of the North Main Street sidewalk at the uh, end at the uh, cement sidewalk that leads back to the community room wing at the north side of the church. Um, plan B details is pour a concrete slab to support the 350th time capsule bench already produced. The bench could be positioned diagonally a short distance from both sidewalks pointing directly at the town commons. The, ca the capsule itself would be diagonally buried between the bench and the two sidewalks. Okay. Pavers would be placed over the time capsule, over which folks might periodically place containers of season flower seasonal flowers or plants. Perennial shrubbery would be planted on either side of the bench itself, allowing visitors to either look towards the commons or look back at towards the new library entrance. Can, can I interrupt? We, need, we, we would need. Um, just not. Yeah, go ahead. All right. Just wanted to ask you uh, are we writing off the Bloody Brook? I thought that was oh. such a great spot. We're writing it off for bearing the time capsule. We're not writing it off for enhancements. For so, what? Uh, for enhancements, improvements. But, and, how, to, to and, why, and you're for sure you can't put the time capsule there? It would take um, a, a mountain of work right. to make that happen. Basically, there's all kinds of historical um stuff is issues showing about up bullet uh, you know musket balls and historical artifacts and okay. yeah. the, the permit the permitting process for that is, is is quite lengthy to be able to go ahead and do because they would consider that a archaeological excavation even though that's not the reason why you're digging the hole but that's is the end result as far as yeah. they're concerned and like i said the, the permitting process is is quite lengthy um, and that is the reason why um, they were looking to move to another location. And just a real quick one, uh, I did dig safe that out the other day. Um, I'm just waiting on one more to come back and I, we should know where, where, we, where all our utilities are, so. It, it's yeah, so Bloody Brook wasn't perfect really, but um, there was, it, it turned to be so complicated with the archeological permitting. Well, it would've been a great place to put it. But yeah, it just would have been didn't happen. Day, so. But we think the next best place is what we're suggesting. So pending the dig safe results, because I'm we're concerned about sewer and water lines more than anything. Is um, there also a uh, we'll make it fit in front of the Tilton. No, there isn't. I'm is sorry. What? what is there a time capsule in front of the Tilton, or is that just a plaque from the last time? Just a plaque. Just a plaque. Okay. All right. We we thought uh, there was one there, but no one no one uh, we couldn't find one. Do we have do we have one from the three hundredth? No. No. Okay. All right. Apparently. And so um so so at the end of this little summary, we need select board approval for this site and concept pending what the dig safe results are. Okay, so but the Bloody Brook Monument Park enhancements still need to be done. So the way we look at it. Um, is four phases between 2024 and 2025. The first one is take down the large dead, I think it's a maple tree, um, to eliminate the dangers to cars and pedestrians and also possible damage to the monument itself in a windstorm because there's big chunks of, of branches coming down now and it's it's really hazardous right Kevin, now. Kevin so, said that he was on tree, top of that, right, Kevin? Tree, tree is end of life. And Jim's is going to be on it within the next week and a half. Are we perfect? Just another tree? 
or not? Uh, that's going to be part of the enhancement, Trevor, that um, Chris was talking about for the whole area. So when when that tree's gone, Chris, do you want to? Can you just go over the timeline of what? Um, it, yeah, what exactly. So um, so the second phase, which is kind of spans a, a bit of time between 24 and 25, is to assess and get quotations for repairs and cleaning of the monument itself. And the repairs might include bordering joints and some foundational work. And John Novi is already in contact with the uh, professional that did the work up at the Civil War Monument in front of Deerfield Academy, because he's probably more um, uh, experienced with dealing with bigger monuments. And so that assessment will be happening soon when he's in the area. And then the idea is that John will probably, from the Deerfield Historical Commission standpoint, put through a CPA request to do any repairs and cleaning and that would occur in the spring of 2025. Um, but meanwhile, in 2024, you know, the Friends of Deerfield want to spearhead upgrading the planning in the circular garden to the north of the monument. It used to be a fountain in the 19, early 1900s, et cetera, and then it was shut off and converted to a, to a garden, but um, it, it could stand to have a, a lot different plants in it and perennials and things like that. People have done a great job putting some things in annually, but it's kind of sporadic. So we're thinking we just clean that up and make that park look more beautiful. And uh, and then part of that, that enhancement of landscaping and look would happen after the monument was repaired and cleaned. Around the base of the monument, we do more landscaping there also. Chris, that sounds so lovely. Thank you. Um, do you have any, does Tim or Trevor, do you have any questions? I'm just wondering, uh, when we look at tree replacement, do we think it's worth considering trees that don't, that have a certain height limit that they don't get above? Or what are you thinking about, Chris? Absolutely. I mean, these trees would probably max out at 15 feet, 12 to 15 feet. They'd probably be flowering. Excellent. I mean, we're, 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 doing this, we're, do, we're doing the same thing at Laurel Hill. We have a nightmare up in that cemetery with these big trees coming down. And, um, and uh, so the replacement strategy is for more contained trees that also have a beauty element of flower. Mm -hmm. Yep. Excellent. Thanks. Kevin, do you have any questions of Chris? No, actually, Chris and I, uh, we've been working together, emailing back and forth, phone calls, uh, multiple phone calls. Uh, you know, I, long story short is, is if you would all agree and vote to allow it to go there, whatever it is, we're going to make it fit. All right. So if this is where it's going to go, this is going to be the best place. We will make it work. So really all I need is, is a vote to allow us to go ahead and put it there. Wonderful. Uh, well, and then I'll, and then I'll then I'll stake out exactly where it's going to go, and then we can move forward from there. And we also need a vote for these enhancements, even in 2024, to the mm -hmm. flower garden, the north of the monument. That you know, you allow us to work with other townspeople to get that done. Sure. Um, so I will make a motion to support the new location of the time capsule uh, near. I, I will just say near the Congregational Church, the 1821 building. Um, and I will also um, uh, be supportive of the any enhancements that you will be doing on the Bloody Brook Monument. Subject to funding by CPA in future cycles. And and Friends of Deerfield. And Friends of Deerfield as well. Yep. Uh, okay. Is there any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor? Tim LGI. Trevor McDaniel, aye. Carolyn Ness, aye. Thank you very much, Chris. Right. Thank you so Chris. much, Kevin. I appreciate um, you having patience with all the changing of the locations. Um, but well, oh, yeah. so so the final thing about that is it will be June eighth now. That's Thanks the for the breathing room, by the way. <laughs> um, and yeah, well, I think everybody felt that at, at this point. But um, uh, so we're thinking about um, eleven thirty a.m. Rain or shine, time capsule, you know, ceremony. And then, at, and then the other approval we need, I guess, is is to be able to use the town hall for a 12 p.m. start um, 
luncheon reception. Um, uh, and so we, so we need your approval on that. And, um, and then we intend to send out invitations to many of the persons in the town that they were some from departments, some just private individuals who contributed a lot during the 350th year. And then it will also be open to the public and we'll, we'll advertise it on social media. Oh, perfect. That's That's Saturday. I don't think that wouldn't be a problem, right, Casey? I don't think so. As long as somebody's here to open the building. I, I will op I will be here to open the building. Yep. Yeah, so it'll be building. Saturday. It would be Saturday, the uh, 8th of June, and the building would need to be open probably at 10 a.m. for the cable. Yeah, it's June 8th. Um, can Neil. you just make sure that that gets penciled in? Chris pencils it in on our calendar. And it's likely they would do setup on uh, Friday, June eight, June seventh, if if that's possible. Yes, it's no problem, Chris. Okay. Thank you. We'll make that happen. Um, next item on the agenda is the night uh, nineteen eighteen eighty eight no, designer. It's a senior. Oh senior wait, senior. yes, I'm sorry. We do not have an update for that. Oh, the okay. Center, yes. senior center. Yeah. Okay. Put a hold on there. Right. Yes. Please. Um. Then Can so. Right. <laughs> yeah. No. You know, I had so many notes here that it took took over that agenda item. Um. 1888 designer recommendation for review and approval. So Tim. So um, we had a a team that really worked well together. Um, Christopher Dunn was helping coordinate and. Uh, and get everyone in the room at the right time. Uh, Julie Chalfant from the Finance Committee and the Town Building Advisory Committee was uh, another member. And we had um, Vern Harrington, formerly of uh, Thayer Street Associates Builders uh, as a construction expert. And um, we had uh, Joseph Matty from uh, Shelburne Associates. He's an architect of 45 years. So they were invaluable in helping us to evaluate um, seven proposals uh we narrowed in our first round we narrowed this to four firms to talk with and um then after an interview process we narrowed it yet again to two people two firms both of them were the, are within about 15 minutes of deerfield um, one of the firms actually built the bank across the street um and um, after some discussion post interviews, we settled on the order of Kuhn Riddle Architects there in Amherst, and um, secondarily, um, Jester Pope Fraser, which is also, um, you know, as I said, 15 minutes away. Um, so uh, before we make any motions, people want to have specific questions you want to ask. So, and this is uh, just the idea of hiring these people, um, I guess just for the public, we're looking to to hire an architectural firm to work with us to design um, moving Town Hall into the 1888 building, building and, along with an addition. Right, yeah. So, I mean, we, we did this, unfortunately, um, in 2022, mm -hmm. and... Um, we didn't have a four million grant in hand and right. we were struggling to um we we plan to use mostly cpa money for the entire project right the firm that was hired was from boston yeah um i had not uh i didn't agree with that decision but um i was one of six or seven people involved and uh, we ended up hiring this boston firm they came up with a plan that was unbuildable because it was too expensive Mm -hmm. um, in this round, we stress from the outset, we have limited funds. We're not going to use tax-based money. We're going to use grants and CPA funds. And you have to be able to work within this budget. And I think we got a group, either one of these architects could do this job and, and deliver what we're looking for. Mm -hmm. Um, some new space, which is easier to build, um, and you know easier to make meet the current codes we also decided that in addition the the main part of the structure the existing structure that's historic 
uh, in nature is the exterior of the brickwork. Every firm that's looked at this building is go just goes, wow. I mean, this is amazing brickwork. Of course, you know, they're architects, they're looking for a fee. Mm -hmm. So is there that element? But I think both of these firms, what separates them from the others is that they are specialists in historic restoration in our area. So um, in fact, both of them use Berkshire Design as the, mm -hmm. the, the site plan consultant and Berkshire, uh, we're very familiar with their work. Right. They've helped us with the Leary lot. Yeah, for sure. So, um, and they, they both had some beautiful projects that they've done with that sort of mirror what we're looking to do there. Fix the exterior of the old building, make the, the first two floors usable, um, do some work to um, keep the basement area dry where they can put in, you know, mechanical units for like heat pumps or, mm -hmm. uh, you know, to make it more energy efficient. And, and then a new structure with an elevator so that you can access the old building and also the two floor structure uh, and elevator um, building mm -hmm. that's new. Um, so, <clears throat> Do we um, either of them come with a fee structure? Or how so we this is how the, the the Massachusetts and municipal bidding rules are often contradictory, right? And you can't talk to people about money before you decide they're qualified, right? Right. Um, if this were they're a private, if this were a private yeah. project, you'd be having those discussions simultaneously, right? Unfortunately, that's not the law. Yeah. Um, so. I don't know if Christopher's actually Christopher, on. I think he is here. And uh, if he has anything he wants to chime in, yes, he was okay. He was part of the process helping us lead this thing. All right. Are you outside? Yeah, you I, I, I am. I had to step outside because the uh, <laughs> the kids were getting ready for bed. Um, yeah, so uh, as Tim was saying, it's a qualifications-based process, so we really weren't aren't able to ask about fee until we've selected someone to enter into contract negotiations with. Um, Joe Maddy, the architect on the committee, did kind of, um, you know, just chat with them to to understand, you know, given the kind of unique circumstances um, of kind of taking over a project midstream, um, you know, how how they would deal with B in that kind of situation. And so we did get a sense from each firm how they would handle that. But again, to Tim's point, it's a qualifications based process. Right. And then you talk money once you pick somebody. Right. Okay. And uh, right. all of the firms that we talked to said, what we need to do as, as a town and as, as a committee is to be very decisive about what we want mm -hmm. and to explain to them what we need. Yes. And um, both of these firms said, I don't have any ego. I am right. perfectly happy to do modest architecture. Right. So what that signals is they've gotten the message that we have a Limited certain amount money. of money. Yeah. We're not going to use real estate tax money. And at the end of the day, we're going to restore a historic building, make it useful again, and have new space and an elevator to make both spaces work together. Mm -hmm. um, and they will also be using air source heat pumps and everything to mm -hmm. reduce to, to meet the goals that the governor and the state have. I mean, Baker had the same goals as yeah. Healy does. So it's not a question right. of, it's a, it's a, it's a science-based program. And um, yeah, so what I'm hoping to do is to get a motion to allow um, our OPM, which is P3, and me as a representative of the select board to begin negotiations with Coon Riddle. Mm -hmm. um, and if we can't reach an agreement, then to begin negotiations with our second choice. Very, very, I, in the oh, first yeah. round, in the first round, the second choice was the first choice. And the second choice was our first choice now. Right. So yeah, they sort of flipped They're positions. Both fantastic companies. Yeah. I, I know of them both and have worked with some. Right. Of, and they've both um, got long history. repeat performance yeah. for, you know, they've got one of Nichols College has been working for 17 years with Jester Pope. Right. And uh and Kundrill has similar they did some great work in Amherst. 
on yeah. a very similar building. Hampshire College. Yeah. yeah. And uh, yeah, stuff. so 79 South Pleasant in Amherst is a is an old collaborative structure, and they built a new structure next to it, linked it by a little glass, uh, mm -hmm. you know, cross crossway, and uh, so. Yeah, so I know. I, it's a good choice. I yeah. support it. Um, I'm willing to make that a motion. No second the motion. Is there any more discussion? No. All those in favor? Tim Hilchi, aye. Trevor McDaniel, aye. Carolyn Ness, aye. And, and, I, and I just wanted to, if one piece I forgot is that we have funds that were already approved for this purpose that we mm -hmm. we just plan to continue. We will use whatever we can from the pre previous study. And I think most of that is not related to the, the interior design that they came up with, but it's related to uh, the measurements of the building, some of the uh, destructive examination they did, what the bricks look like. Um, they're going to have to do some of that, but um, we've asked, you know, we asked the architects to reach out to the previous firm and see what, if anything, they can get from them um, so they can maybe um, not have to do as an extensive, a, a more of a verification. Do you have a question on what Kate, funds you said? I did. I had a question about funds because at your request, Tim, I had Chris do some research on a vote for um, use of ARPA funds, and we don't have a formal vote. We see discussion, but not a formal vote. So oh, right, right. Yeah. The, you know, this, this is actually this is actually CPA money. CPA money. It's, oh. yeah, yeah, it's CPA money. It's for, it, for this part. For this, yeah. for this okay. part, yeah. That's so, fine. And uh, the timeline is to try and be able to bring some um, preliminary designs to the public, have some public hearings in beginning of July, mm -hmm. uh, refine things. By the end of August, uh, we would have cost estimates and, uh, you know, I guess they call it schematic design. Mm -hmm. Everybody talks slightly differently about what that state will be. Right. And um, there'll be more input from the public and um, then we'll bring something to small town meeting uh, about, um, you know, a, a use of significant use of CPA funds to do the historic restoration portion, and then to um, use the $4 million grant that uh, Senator Markey Warren and McGovern helped us w out with. Um, right. what, what's the date do we have to expend that by? What? The grant money. Yeah. There's an. Uh, this is something maybe Chris can speak to because we. It's going to be a process. I mean, it's it's federal government grants. So, um, is there a date that we have to worry about, Chris? That we have to spend it by. So they haven't uh, released their guidelines just yet. Um, so the the those are being refined, I guess, amongst congressional staff. Um, the way the process will work is basically, um, it, I think everyone's familiar with the USDA Community Development Fund, uh, Rural Development Fund from, uh, I, Trevor, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think we use that for the wastewater treatment plan. Yes. Um, yeah. so, so basically this earmark has created a, a pool of money in that fund and we have to apply to that fund to access that money. Um, so... They've already sent us, you know, some initial steps we can take to kind of prepare for when we're able to enter into that process. Um, but as in terms of, you know, when the money has to be spent by, we don't have that info just yet. Oh, yeah. But if it's coming through rural USDA, it's okay. It's not the same as regular grant money where you have to expend it usually by a, once it's committed, we just have to fill out the paperwork. Once it's committed, it's not, it doesn't have an end date like a lot of the other grants do so it's okay but obviously sooner you spend it the, oh no the less expense no the less expensive yes. the materials yes. are so i'm not worried yeah. about that but i was worried about you know if we have you i mean usually yep. a lot of the you don't want to you don't want to lose out because you weren't able to get yeah. the project on on course yet yeah the right. good thing is that um warren I've, i spoke with elizabeth warren a couple of times about this by phone and um and also, Jim McGovern was fabulous about supporting this. They all really liked the project. Um, I, I talked to McGovern's aide and uh, said, geez, if I'd known there was all the support, I would have asked for $6 million. He said, well, you know, they might not have given it to you. That's right. So you asked for the right amount of money. So it worked. Was, yeah. It worked. Yep. Okay. Um, 
next item on the agenda is um, we're not ready to do the contract for the um, tree filter up near the our sidewalk there in um, okay. Old Deerfield, right, no. Casey? No. Okay. Um, so the next item is then ARPA. We're not going to do that, or okay? So I gave you a list of projects as they were reported to Treasury on Monday for the ARPA funds. We have to do this report every year. Right. Um, but to the point of the discussion point of a minute or so ago, um, in terms of the 1888 building, it would be a good idea for the board to take a vote formally to allocate funds. Right. But I do have a request, and it's based on we need to just, do it tonight, do we? No. Just some right. concern on my part. Um, if so, I know that there was an intent to utilize the remaining funds from the um, the ARPA, the remaining ARPA funds for the 1888 building, right. but. Since the 1821 building is an old structure and we could find surprises, I've been thinking about this. Would the board consider allocating some funds in the case that we have unforeseen expenses we, that could come up? The, well, the town also has to figure out how to deal with a shortfall or do that roundabout right. in front of the That's high school. So maybe next Trevor, week from now. On top of it. I am on top. I, I think they're having a conversation. I with, think there's leftover MVP money, right? Yes. Yeah, I'm having a conversation with today. Chris Nolan yeah. and with Brenda, and I will get back to Darius next week. Okay. I'm we, on the top. We have two other left. We have two pots of MVP money left. We have over. two pots in special funds, but we also have um, another allocate, another piece of money left over. All right. Yes. And I, need, I, I actually would like to. Um, just verify a few numbers in the update that Casey sure. provided. Yep. So, okay. um, yeah, we'll do it next week or yeah, the following yeah, I just week. wanted to bring it up so we can, can keep talking about yep. it because That's we good. do have to allocate those funds and have signed contracts before the end of the year. Okay. We will. Um, maybe so speaking of the 1821 building, um, you're moving forward on that contract. Yep. I have, I'm actually waiting to hear back from Senexo. Um, I had sent them a request. They, we had been talking about something. I sent them a request. I haven't heard back from my contact over there. So I'll let you know as soon as I have more information. Okay. If, I, I just if, want to if, make sure we get those repairs going. Yeah, no, it's it's basically, I think, just giving them a little more breathing room to, they, the, I, correct me if I'm wrong, the original contract was calling for a spe specified time of start and completion. And Synaxo's concern was that we really need to open it up first and see because uh, although um, Structures North is an excellent, you know, historic church restoration engineer, we we don't want to be surprised and then find out we need to bring in a different type of equipment. Right. So that's fine. I think no, that's, um, fine. that's what Casey's trying to iron that's out. That's what I was trying. Thanks. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um. So when you can, are we off? Did we authorize you going forward that if this is sign okay to sign the contract? No, but if you want to do that, you would. I would want you to take a vote. Yeah, I would. I will make that motion um, that to um, authorize Casey to sign the contract as soon as this um, gets ironed out. Second. Is there any further discussion? No. Nope. Uh, hearing none, all those in favor? Tim Hilgey, aye. aye. Trevor McDaniel, aye. Carolyn Ness, aye. But, uh, please get going on that. Yep. yep. I'm, you know, I, I'm so worried about that. Okay. Um, what do we have on here? Oh, municipal hours of operation. Yes. So I became aware of the requirement in the bylaw to open on Friday. I honestly, I can't, I, I literally can't remember every bylaw. I apologize. Um, so if the board... I, I think you took we took a formal vote to close, so we should probably have you folks take a formal vote to open um, on Fridays from now on. I think we're back to, I mean, we did this when we didn't have any staff at all, and it was COVID. So it was allowing us to really get our work done. And now we have filled out the office positions quite a bit. Yeah, we're so, mostly up to speed. Um, we've still, we've got a lot more help. Oh, but. for sure. Yeah, we have new new staff starting and so uh, i think also um i agree with trevor that but within each department there should be flexibility for um the managers to say this staff person is going to have three hours where they're not going to be disturbed right yeah and, and it's important to get your job done yeah, yeah. i agree with that too, for sure yep 
and we're we've got some great leaders in each of these departments and so yes i trust their judgment yep um, i do too so this is for all departments so make a motion for the municipal offices yes for mm -hmm. all departments in the municipal offices um open that you control yes um eight to four right or nine to, no, four. nine to four. Nine to four. Nine to four. Nine to four. Yeah. Monday through Friday. Monday through Monday Friday. Monday through Friday. Okay. And that you made the motion? Yep. Second. All those in favor? Tim Hilchey, aye. Trevor McDaniel, aye. Carolyn Ness, aye. Um, Do we need Christopher Dunn for anything else? No. no oh, Christopher, you don't have family. to. <laughs> yeah. And, and Thank you. also, Kevin. Thank you, Chris. I, um, does anyone have any questions more for Kevin? Nope. Okay. Kevin, thank you for coming. I yep. appreciate that. Thanks, Kevin. Very cool. Thank you. Everybody yeah. have a good night. You too. Thanks all. Thanks. Yeah, night, Christopher. Yep. Night, Chris. Um, upcoming sewer bills and related water readings. Yes. Yeah, so I was advised um, end of last week, so I put it on the agenda to discuss it with, with you, that we need to get those bills out mm -hmm. for revenue purposes. I know. I need to talk to you about yes. it, too, Trevor. Yeah. Um, I would like some manner of support from the board so that we can connect and get those things facilitated because otherwise we could face I know trouble. we got to talk to Heather because I know that she's been you know she struggling to get the free cash certified for the water department and I think she's got there now but that uh, there might be a timing thing but we need to like really yeah. stress either that or we need to come up with a different system for sewer bills. So um, that was actually part of a conversation I had about Right. This. And um, we could we do the same do thing as we we could do the same thing we do with um you know, we'll be doing with the first two two quarters of taxes where we can estimate based on last year and then the second bill is more of a settled up. And we would so that did pass at town meeting and that doesn't go into effect until FY26. Right, exactly. I'm just the yeah. methodology. I, I mean, we'll, we'll we'll talk to her first oh. and see if we can get some it's pretty, It's pretty, I have to tell you, it's pretty hard to be free. I, I know, mean, I know, exactly. Well, I mean, that's what I mean. The water district do, gives us free. They so. do give us free. So we can't be too picky, but be. we do also have to get it in time or else it's no good. So Well, but the other thing is, is I want to make sure that we... Uh, that there's somebody sort of shepherding this on in the administration position right. and alleviate some stress on other employees so that we can get this done without creating a huge yeah. level. Of yeah, last effort. time maybe it was the, really maybe, rough. On maybe, yeah, yeah, maybe we can yeah. estimate. Let's, yeah. So, so we'll that's talk, why yeah. Brenda and I had started yep. working on this um, and I wanted to. Yeah, you're going to have to check with DOR though. Yeah. You can do that. Well, we'll sure. start. I will have What's to for, talk, but yeah, yeah. I think what what I'm more concerned about now is finding a way for maybe the two of us yes. to work on yes. this. Talk to with Heather that. and the and Stanley okay. and yeah. all about it. Yeah. Okay. 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 Um, we have two permits up next: Deerfield Academy Alumni Weekend one day. Yep. Um, I'll make a motion to for approve. June for the alumni uh, reunions. It's um. Is it several days or is it just well two? it's set up day so you get set up day and yeah so um, it's a three day time period I believe three three day time period with set up on either side. Yep. So, so um it's June seventh, eighth, and ninth. Do you want a motion? Yes. Well, yep. I'll make a motion to approve the one day liquor licenses for June seventh, eighth, and ninth, uh for um Trustees of, Academy, uh, trustees of Deerfield Academy. Second. Okay. All those in favor? Tim Milchie, aye. Trevor McDaniel, aye. Carolyn Ness, aye. And then we have one for um, PVMA Green River Festival exhibit opening at Memorial Hall Museum on May 11th from 12 to 2, and it will be BBC beer. And so I'll entertain a motion for that. The motion to... I'll make a motion to approve the one-day liquor license for May 11th for Wicomtec Valley Memorial Association. Second. All those in favor? Tim Hilchey, aye. Carolyn Ness, aye. Trevor McDaniel, aye. Okay. We don't have any letters of support this week, although I was going to try to squeeze one in for the nope. rural aid. No, nope. I know. We're I done. Know. I know. We need to get yeah. done. I, 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 I ended up making phone calls. Thank it's you. okay. Um, Leary lot and other developments we covered. Yep. I think most of that's covered in yep. Chris's report. Yeah, we can read, we can read his report. 
Um, is there any appointments? I don't see anything for election officers. I think we put this on as a place. We did, yeah, yeah, because we did last last yep. uh, time, but not anything okay. right now. Um, and were we going to do um, town account and job description? So I had printed this out and given it to you guys a few weeks ago. I have more copies. Um, this is the version that Chris now ordered for you earlier this month. Um, and it reflects there was one slight change they had me make on it, but it what you see now is what they had approved. So essentially, this outlines um, the essential functions with a few more details after I talked to uh, Brenda. Brenda and I worked on this pretty uh, significantly to make sure we tried to capture as much as we could. Um, but it does capture things like attending town meeting um, for financial purposes you know, providing um, guidance and the oversight of guidance for budgets, oversight of budgets and pay and payments. So it covers the gamut, but it is a little more fleshed out than the old job description was. It also follows the new format. Am I remembering maybe seeing a version of this at some point or did I? Yes, you, that... I, I had given you a version a yeah. few weeks ago. Um, but it was right as we were getting into the crunch time of town meeting. So I had just, I had added it to this agenda, hoping we could uh, have you guys review it. But then I realized I had forgotten to put this into the meeting materials folder in the S drive. So okay. <laughs> I have to tell you, I'm really worried about placing Brenda. But... Well, this is part of our planning process for succession planning because we need to get this addressed. Um, just and then so G and I cute. are going to sit down and go through some succession planning. We'll probably want to speak to you all at one point, at some point. Mm -hmm. I know it's just because we need to come up with timelines and you know make sure that we're well. I, I, I just the budget as well. There's so few qualified. I know, and that's uh, that's the reason we wanted to get started on this. Yep. Yeah. Um. So speaking Chris of a question, speaking of um you know, job descriptions. We had um, originally set up a meeting for May 8th at six o'clock to talk about, start talking about the highway mm -hmm. job description. But um, Chris no. Nolan had scheduled a MVP meeting at six. So um, I'm wondering, we, we had the 8th and the 13th. Is there any possible way that we could um, reschedule that meeting on the 8th? Maybe are you are you guys available? Um, I mean, we could do Tuesday night or Friday or so, I mean, I we don't we or we could go into the next week and we have one on the thirteenth. Maybe we could do one on the twentieth. Yeah. Although I was hoping to take a vacation. I haven't had a vacation since two thousand nineteen. <laughs> so I was hoping my husband's gets through graduation. That's all three graduations. Yeah, I, would, I guess busy month too with yeah. Caleb's graduating and stuff too. What are you suggesting? Well, we have we had the meeting set up for the 8th and 13th. So the MVP meeting now is scheduled for 6 on the 8th. Which was originally when you were going to talk about what the job you on the 13th and then just see where we Okay, keep it. right. All right. I mean, yeah. so it just will give eight. me some time to gather some yeah. job descriptions right. for you all to look at. Perfect. Perfect. I also have a suggestion about that. I think it might be useful if we maybe had somebody take a look at the entire operation and give us yeah. some insight into how things are running. Yeah. Um, yeah. And in fact, this was a suggestion from um, Brenda. Yeah. And just I think it was, it's useful to consider. Yeah, Chris, did you have a, a comment? I just had a quick question because I'm probably out of the loop here, but is Brenda going to retire or move on very soon? Yeah. She will be retiring at the end of the FY25 fiscal year. So what we need to do is we need to create a succession plan so we can bring in a replacement that you know has the qualifications we need and has time to be trained. Okay, fantastic. Yes. <laughs> and Kevin is Kevin, Kevin is moving on. Um, He's moving on in July, no. July 7th or something yes. like that. Yeah. So, okay. so, yeah, that's so why I wanted to say I was just thinking about how we could, you know, after Brenda and I discussed it, I thought it made sense if we could maybe engage somebody to 
yeah, to an start idea. an evaluation and yep. maybe talk to, you know, we need some, we need eyes on this that are familiar with that type of operation, because I'll be honest with you, I'm not an expert. Yeah, no, we, I, I have a, I have um, somebody in mind. I'd love to chat with you all about yep, it. I would like to, well, I would like to too, but I think we need to, first, I would like to have a conversation with the person. There is somebody that yeah. um, Brenda had suggested. We'd like to have that conversation. Right. Um, and report back to the board and, and report get, back get to ideas board. from us on the 13th. Oh, okay. that's fine. Yeah. Um, and uh, just so everyone's aware, Trevor's been talking with some DPW experts. Um, I've at the MMA conference this weekend, we, we discussed the possibility of um, having conversations with our neighboring select board members about how their DPWs operate, possibly, you know, talking with their DPW chiefs. I think it's a good, a good idea that you brought up Casey, that, uh, it's an opportunity is when transitions take place to right. yeah. find out whether the operation is, is needs to be, you know, perhaps refocused. Yeah. So, um, and yeah. also the, the other person I have in mind, Casey, to talk to is Chris Bouchard. He's the one that helped us do the uh, bundled NOI. Okay. So and you're going to have to give me his contact. Yeah. He's, um, he now works for Mass DOT, but he was the Beckett super, superintendent. And he so, was, were we still on the? I just just to clarify where we, right? Well, we, it sort of was offline. For right. Yeah, it is offline. It's, at it's the still moment. the accountant, right? Yeah. yeah. And, um, are we looking to? I mean, I looked at an earlier version of this, but I'm happy to, you know. I just want to take it. Take a look. I, I, I need. Yeah, I don't want to. I don't want to do it tonight. I was trying to figure out yep. whether we're gonna. Is this us for us to review so we could? Yes, or, because that's okay. what has been approved by personnel. Okay. Okay. Good. Excellent. So we'll come back to you on that. I yeah. I want to be able to read it. Um. No, it was just that we, Brenda's bringing up Brenda triggered Kevin who yeah. was leaving in July. So yeah. that's why I want to make sure we're on top of this. Sure. Plus we had the conflict with the meeting that we already sent up. So yeah. just make sure Chris knows that. Um, not to worry about the select board meeting on right. the 8th. Right. Okay. He and I talked about it before he left. All right. Um, is there anything you want to add, um, Casey, to your... In terms time? of updates? Yeah, I got a couple. Um, so like I said earlier, I'm following, following up on the relish contract. Um, I've been following up on the landfill solar project, the library reno project, sort of, you know, trying to make sure I'm in the loop on with what the OPM needs for assistance from us. Um, I've been, I've had a couple conversations with Lily about the 83 to 85 North Main Street property, and that is fully, uh, we've supplied all the information and all the payments that we need to for that. Um, I'm just keeping track of the PDHVAC in case they need signatures or any kind of facilitation on my part. Um, I've been attending the rural affairs meetings. I'm also, we've had several records requests that I'm working on with other staff members. Um, but right now, now that town meeting's over, um, I've been working to make sure that we have all the information that Cassie needs so that she can finish putting together um, any, the submission to the AG's office. And I did, Cassie was looking through some materials and she um, she found something that was really encouraging. So. As you know, the personnel bylaw amendment was approved at town meeting. Um, it turns out that does not have to go to the AG's office for approval. So it will go into effect July 1st. Um, so I appreciate the fact that the board and personnel board have been really pushing me to make sure that we have some sort of um, draft manual in place that includes our current benefits and policies um, because as you all are aware um, we needed something for that gap. So the board had approved that the draft manual that I had put together um, in assuming that, that, you know, or pending ratification by town meeting. So that will be in place for us to start with, but I will start collecting um, policies for review because there are several policies we don't have in place that we'll need to, some of them I've already got drafts of, but we'll need to start addressing the policies we need to have so that we're legally compliant. So I will be discussing this with personnel board. It's on their agenda for the 23rd of May. Okay. So those are some of the things that I've been following up on. Um, hold on one second, let me make sure I copy. Um, 
There's several things I've been working with legal on, but right now legal, so as you know, it's town meeting. Um, so council has been working with many of the communities that they uh, serve to address their town meeting. So I think if there's anything we need to deal with in terms of council, it's probably gonna need to wait for at least three or four weeks so that they can get out from under all of the other town meetings they have to deal with. Um, one thing that I think we can take up that I will be able to work on is now that the personnel bylaw amendment was approved, I think I can finalize the contract um, grant report for that particular item. So we can expect, I'll deal with the bill when, when it gets here, but that should be out of the way. There's another grant that I still need some help with that I'm going to have to work on. Um, but luckily, you know, we've got Christopher and Chris working on several different grants that make it easier for me to refocus on some of this other stuff. So I appreciate that. Um, and I think there's permit. So there was another thing that had come up. It came up a couple of weeks ago. Bob and I had talked about it, the building commissioner. Um, the board will probably see some suggested changes to permit fees. Um, there are several types of fees that we haven't made changes to in over 10 years. So I asked Bob to gather some information up and we'll give you some more information, but you'll see it on an upcoming agenda. Um, I also want to adjust a couple of the Board of Health fees. Mm -hmm. Some of the second and third inspections, actually, we want to decrease and there's one that we want to increase. So, yeah, Dick had okay. mentioned that to me. Yeah. Um, what we'll need is we'll need an outline of what that looks like. Yep. Okay. Uh, there. Oh, this is what I wanted to mention. So, two things. Stillwater Bridge. Just so you know, I've been keeping up with that, what we need to do. And we scheduled a meeting with MassDOT, myself, council, so we can go over the notification requirements and process. Okay. And we specifically included council in that because we know it's going to be a heavy lift. Um, I've already reached out to an appraising company to get us in the loop for that. Mm -hmm. um, and we've, we've, uh, I haven't reached out for surveying yet, but I wanted to wait until I had a chance to talk to council about it. So we have a meeting. Did you have any information on the timeline to get um, approval from um, DCR? I think I'll know more once we meet on the time. Okay. So I will report back please, to the board. Please after try that. to nail that down and make sure we're moving on that because we are, but I, I, I know, sure I know, but now I that just, we have approved plans. So we do have approved plans. The only way I am aware that you can lift uh, re conservation restriction is through legislative process. Right. And, and so, so Lisa had to prefaced get, that need, with me. Yeah, we need to get into the line on that. Uh, the le this le legislative period ends, I think, July 31st. Okay, so we need to get in line, the first in line. In you know, I like will the, do my best, but I need yeah. to hear what DOT has yeah. to say before yeah. I can. That's oh yeah, no, I know, plan. but but I'm just saying the timeline that I'm aware of, the legislative timeline, the new session is. August 1st, mm -hmm. I believe. So make sure we're like first in line, everything is organized so we can get like right in there. Well, that's the reason that we're meeting so that we can get organized yeah, and I'm set so up a nervous timeline about for us that. to pursue these next yeah. things. Um, yeah. There's also something that Trevor and I have been working on and that's sewer regulation. So we need some assistance from DEP, uh, from DPC on this. Mm -hmm. um, and he and I will circle the wagons on that. Mm. Um, the... Uh, supposed to be on the agenda today but it got sucked up with an f1 pipe so yeah so we were supposed to have that conversation yes um it's always something yeah it is always something so i think that's pretty much where i've been picking up pieces things that had fallen off my radar screen from town meeting so I um i would just like to thank woman hill for their um contribution in lieu of yes. taxes i saw that came in so that's it very did. grateful for that thank you woman hill and for a small and entity just like so that, everybody knows very generous. That right. timeline for 12 month receipts is April 12th to April 12th. And the reason it is, is because we try to keep it, Brenda tries to keep it close to when town meeting happens. Yeah. Yeah. But she has to have a start and an end date. Yep. No, that was great. Very, very, so anything that we received that. after April 12th will get reported next year. Okay. I just I just want to make sure that they are aware. 
Mm -hmm. Is there any public comment? Any, Chris, do you have anything? Or Charlene, do you want to? You'll need to step up yeah, for the mic, Charlene. The mic. Yeah. Welcome, welcome. I just wanted to um, give you a timeline about uh, the article that got defeated at the town meeting, because I know at one of the last select board meetings I was here, I did ask who presented it and um, why. And you know, your answer was very clear. It was a citizen's petition and it was done by the book. Um, yeah. But I wanted to hear, I wanted to learn more. So I did do some research over the last few days. And I, I just wanted to share it with you basically. So sure. um, on April 9th, 2024, there was a joint school committee meeting of all four elementary schools and the high school. So that would be five, five school committees. At that meeting, a Sunderland school committee member who had attended the Massachusetts Association of School Committees I guess it's an annual meeting or something, um, came back with information about uh, 17 uh, resolutions that the, the Massachusetts organization wants um, made available to school committees to consider. Mm -hmm. Of those, and they were all, they all have a deadline of November, 2024. So of those resolutions, one was this voting age one. Mm -hmm. So it, basically came back by way of yeah, this so one good. Sunderland School Committee member. And I, I'm i not sure if this person's the chair or not, to be honest, but yeah. I know it is some, okay. Um, and so this, the all five school committees heard about the resolution um, and they had this guy, I actually, you know, I listened to the whole thing. It's, I have to tell you, listening to these tapes, I know my hearing is not good, but it's Miserable. really hard. It's so really difficult. hard. It's much better, I'm sure, to be at the meeting. But um, so anyway, at this meeting, there was a discussion by, and I don't know if everyone discussed because it's hard to see the whole hmm. group of people that were there. But several people discussed. Some were not in favor of it. Some were in favor of it. At the same time, they distributed the citizens' petition, which was signed at that meeting, apparently. Um, so uh, it gained support and it was decided that it would go forward to, on, as a warrant item on each of the towns. So that was on April 9th, 2024. Then I happened to listen to uh, the joint meeting of the finance board of the Deerfield Finance Board and the Select Deerfield Select Board on April 16th. Um, and uh, one of the things that was mentioned in there by uh, the Board of Selectmen was that the government classes at Frontier were immersed in discussions of uh, this type and that that was part of uh, the thought for having this uh, resolution come forward. I did contact the administration at Frontier and I did not get that same information um, at all. And I, I tried to be very specific and clear. So I'm not sure where that came from. It isn't my um, concern to question it. I just want you to know that was, um, and the, these were from two administrators at the high school. Um, they, they had no school-wide incentive to do this and the government classes and the social studies classes um, did not have movement toward this. So I just wanted you to know that. So that's coming from the school. Um, yeah, so I reviewed that meeting too because I wanted to make sure I said what I said and I think I spoke just to the process of getting it on well, the that's ballot. What I'm only looking for yeah. the process because right. I mean, you know well, how I felt because I spoke at yeah, the town meeting, but I, it's a serious article and the, anything to me that's serious and impacts uh, taxpayers is something I think should have a really extended discussion. Absolutely. And, and uh, as I said, I've always been a proponent as a teacher, as a human being, to always see both sides of the, uh, sure. of the and problem. I and so when I spoke to process, I spoke to the process of, as, as we were, as we were instructed, 
March 20th. The, 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 uh, the petition was done properly, whether oh, it was yeah. done through no, the school, no, yeah. that stuff that I didn't get into, right. but right. the process was done and we were instructed by council that this made the, the citizens have done what they were supposed to do. Apparently some towns are going to pass it and some towns won't. Right. And then it will probably go to the state and maybe nothing will happen. Right. Well, and I know. And I also uh, mentioned to you that you said, well, everything passes. And I said, well, I don't know about this. Well, this one, this, was, is... this one, I think, had debate because it was the only article of the 21 that the finance board did not support. So I think, I think that a... sometimes puts a little change on how the article is looked at by the people it's, sitting it's in the yeah, and um, and you, and there are we've seen it at many meetings where certain articles get controversial. But um, so I just wanted you to know that, and um, and I do know I, I'm. It's just um, one of the school committee members. Um, I think it was an elementary one. I'm getting to know people's names now. I <laughs> really didn't know them before, but I'm glad you did. Um, one of the things um, she sent me were, were the responsibilities and roles for the school committee. And I was trying, I looked at them and I thought, where does this fall that the school committee would promote it to it become an article? Well, I mean, we can stretch anything when it comes sure to legality, can. right? So I did find under advocacy, it looks like it might have fallen into that because it deals with local concerns and issues. Um, but my point is, and I, I'm just, I'm probably thinking too much like a teacher, but. I feel when you have a really important article of any type, whether it's on this issue or something, not issue, but this matter or something else, that all the ducks have to be in a row. Um, for instance, if this was really something that, you know, obviously those three young girls who presented were part of some group um, outside of the school to no, bring that. No, they're part of the class. Well, see, I don't know, Trevor. I don't think, yeah, so you may not have the right information, but yes, they're part of the student body there, and they were in advocating for this. Was However, it a club? It, was, was it a club? It could be a club. I'm not sure. So It really, wasn't done in the classes. It's a, no. um, it's a citizen's petition, so people bring citizen's petitions for all kinds of things to us, and right. we just okay. if they meet 15 signatures, it comes on. It could be to stop the bombing in Gaza. Oh, yeah. It could I, be... Yeah whatever so instead of so we take those articles and set them at the end of the meeting because they're not anything that we've had discussions about like any other article goes through finance committee capital planning or any other the finance committee did review it because they, no, they did they, they thought it had a financial component. Yeah, right. correct. Because yeah. the cost I, of running is separate. But it doesn't have the same, yeah, exactly. same weight of a regular town article that we typically would bring forward as a select right. board. It's just one of those things. If it meets the requirements, it comes on there. Well, I think I would be interested to know what that group was because I did not get that information from the school at all. Yeah. And the I, school might not be aware of it. I mean, yeah. it's well, it might. That's what I'm saying. The group outside the school, then obviously that's private, and, yeah. and that's not not anything the school would be able to know. But um, it did come from the school committee, so that's where it mm -hmm. got a little tricky to me. But again, I, I know things can be yeah. uh, changed in a heartbeat. But my my point is that where this is something important, and I I know they were asking how many what's. 16 and 17 year olds there were, and it was a small number, but to me, that wasn't the point. The point is the bigger part of the conversation, which is this is a long-term um, law that would be in place at the local level. So it doesn't matter if you have two one year or 20 another year or a hundred another year, it's, it's going to always be there. So, you know, I know um, that seemed to be a, a, a point that some people were uh, thinking about. But I'm just, you know, my point is, again, that <laughs> if this was something, an article for the town, I think it would have been great to have a survey of your 16 and 17-year-olds because those young girls that presented weren't, they must have been 12 or 13. They they were only in seventh or eighth grade. They were not. Yeah, I, I they understood were, they were seventh yeah, graders. Yeah, yeah, they weren't the older older children. So... I just feel, again, if you do something that's really important, 
and has some kind of effect on the taxpayers. It's it's more important to have when a you say this. you, what do you mean by you? Do you mean us or do you mean a town? Well, I, I'm just yeah, trying I to stone, understand. I stone, yes. I, am, am I wrong that all articles for town meeting are approved by the select board? Right. No, we just told you that if yeah. it, if, a, if a citizen's petition we have follows the rules, lawyers. it's a requirement. Uh, we are. That's legally, what we were told anyway. We, yeah, our lawyer could have misinformed us, but we were following legal yeah. advice. Legally, we so have any, to put an option. Any citizen, any anything, anything. anything. So but, how how does that get? You have fifteen or twenty signatures, and it has legally makes sense language. We are compelled by law to put it on, hmm. because it doesn't. I mean, especially a citizen petition. It's just instructing the select board to do something. We don't Correct. have to do it. It's just Correct. say it's like at the end of the year they uh, somebody would stand up and I want to make Is a citizen petition, petition or a, a you know that I'd like the select board to wear blue every every Friday in the afternoon. It, it, it doesn't matter what they say. Trevor, I just want to check um, with Casey. Um, is a petition different than what I think you're talking? Yeah, about no, you're getting orders. confused. Yeah, standing you're orders are often right? they're not they're, they're no. this one actually said. I don't know the language. This was a citizen's petition that went through that entire process. To talk to somebody else. Right. Right. Well, so we, but we because could have made it, our own decision. If, if yeah. it got defeated, but if it passed, we would have to we do We would have that been because, bound to follow the Because the town right. meeting right. approved it. Right. right. Whereas we had nothing to do with it, Charlene. Well, all, all, all I'm saying is, how then how would... Um, you, you could, you could, anybody you, else, how you do could you go about contesting it or something? You, you, you can't. You follow the democratic process. Right. You, you go to town to meeting and town you vote it down. Right. That is the democratic process. Okay. Um, we also, I will say, um, in general, a citizen's petition, we devote as administrative staff a lot of time and effort to that warrant. So notification to the public goes out according to the requirements in our bylaws and statute. So when that warrant gets posted, that's your notification that this will be a discussion item. So that that was my other question. Did so, well, I think Trevor told me somebody came to a select board meeting to present no, an adult. When I looked when I looked back at, I because I watched them. the meeting, uh, Casey notified us that it, that uh, at that meeting, which is March twentieth, right. he notified us that the residents had entered into the clerk a citizen, citizen petition. petition so and she checked with council and yeah it was march 20th meeting of march 20th she gave us and it notification met, and casey said that they got the and i don't i maybe the she signatures came had later. to be certified i think it was a meeting yes. after that where somebody came and talked about it i can't remember Cassie yeah, right? certified it, and, right. yeah, and we are have compelled to, to put it on to the April 9th, then. Something yeah, yeah because I mean, we closed the warrant when? The warrant had to be closed we by the 28th it. We opened it of and March. closed it on the, on the 20th of March, just specifically because they brought this in and said you have to put this so on. So we, it went through this, the signature certification process. Right. This was forwarded to council because we wanted to be sure we were following the rules. And her advice to us was, it needs to go on the warrant, yeah. period. So we opened it. No, I, the they warrant. satisfied the requirements. Well, so in turn, we satisfied our requirements to put it on the warrant and notify the public according to the warrant requirements. And then people did their, and I'm confused did their due diligence the to go to town meeting. So, Charlene, you can, you can submit a citizen's petition and compel us to put it on the warrant because it meets the legal requirements. Right. right. And the only way you can defeat it is through town meeting. That's right. We have no box. power over it one no, way or the other. I understand what you're the saying. The select board yeah. has to do it. Yeah. We're legally compelled. Well, I think too what I've heard what I heard from I I think her name was Miss Missy Novak. Is mm -hmm. she on the school committee? She's on the Frontier School Committee okay. from, from town. She mentioned at that joint meeting that there's sort of an initiative by the state to get a lot of towns to pass this kind of thing hmm. via citizens petition the or... only thing i could think of would be that that maybe from the from the mm so oh yeah that came Massachusetts from there. Right. school committee association would would have had that it wouldn't be the state it would be the association 
they have a, a thing every November at the Cape, and that's probably where okay. that came up, and that's maybe where everybody found it, brought it back, and talked to the Well, it's definitely, it. I saw the list of the resolutions are, right. are all over the place as far as right. topics go. Right. Yeah. But um, the, the thing that Missy mentioned at that meeting was that if there are enough of those towns that vote this in at their town meetings or whatever their form of government is, right. then it might push it Correct. To, uh, beyond the local level. And that level. was the whole instruction of the resolution to ask us to do it, Sunderland to do it, Waitley to do it, and then that might give weight to Cambridge, Northampton, and other towns that have already done it. Then all the all the senators and reps would go, well, look at all the towns that are wanting to do this. Let's discuss well, I know. it. That, and... It looks better for them yeah. to have that. They have I, I get That's that. How you build the support for something you want. But again, the the people who don't feel strongly that this should happen, it's it's town it's, meeting. It's town a meeting. Town it's come to town meeting. Look, it's only one by three votes. But I I Correct. just wonder if you had. If and they can bring it back next year. about it. I don't think a lot of people knew about it. At yeah. least people we talked to said right. they we didn't know about it. We just tried to post it on. Well, know, it was on the newspaper every, on that yeah. Friday yes. before yeah. the Monday meeting. So that yeah. was the only real. Right. You have a comment? We're, yeah, I just, no, I just have a quick factual check. Exactly how many um, voters were at town meeting versus how many voters we have registered in your We know have 4,001 registered voters. We had we had 293, I believe. Oh, we have 293? 293, 293, which is a pretty good turnout, good. actually. And some people left um, after we did the Article 20. Once the once the 5 million borrowing authority was rescinded, I saw oh. 15 or 20 people. So I think so, that so, so we had less than So we had less than 7.5% of the yes. total voting yeah. yes but, that's unfortunately but, the case all the time right Charlene? Yeah. actually I, I had a pretty good job i'll tell you myself personally my husband and i have gone for 50 years to yeah. town meeting yeah. and yeah. everything gets voted in and you yeah. think to yourself why waste your evening if you know everything's going to get and then in the last few years which i think again is unfortunate because i look at things, you know, with both sides. And if you have debate, I can think of a few individuals who actually said something which was quite contrary to the the majority of people sitting in the audience. And it was difficult for them. And so it, you know, it's human nature. Do you want to stand up and possibly, you know, have a problem because you've st stood up and said something and it, it takes a lot more. And I have to say that young boy, that 14 year old, mm -hmm. I don't know who he was. Um, Mark Brennan the third. Yep. Mark what Brennan a great, I mean, great. I don't young, understand this. When child. people say this, they, they seem to imply that there's one side that's empowered to speak and another side that's not. And I just think that's not true. I mean, I don't think that's, you're hearing Tim from people who have experienced it differently. Maybe uh, that's my my feeling is I I'm not afraid to talk, but I yeah, have I'm not gotten braver until now because I feel your voice has to be heard. That's exactly, this is what town meeting is for. Right. It's for friends and neighbors who might not agree on all issues to get together and talk to each other and make decisions. And and I I do know that this is on a, one of the meeting tapes. I you you mentioned. All these things always get approved. And I said, well, I'm not sure about this one. And well, it proved that it wasn't because the will of the people who well, were in attendance at that right. meeting was that they didn't right. think it was a good idea. Well, I do know some people were there just for that particular vote. Yeah. Well, I that's, mean, that's because they that means they must have heard of that. So that was good. Right. Yeah. That's yeah. good. So, so they voted. Um, but it would be good if we could get more people without a doubt. We need but a larger space, too. Like, that's the that's only one a huge in the thing. audience at the end of the meeting. And I miss my Jeopardy. I know. We well, they started. We didn't realize that this was why you were going to be here. We no, I just, you. I just, you know, the and and I loved. Uh, so there was really no, from what you said, there's there was no select board meeting that I can find where this person. No, came before I, I looked you. back today, oh, and I have I, a I kept to looking you. after I yeah. talked to you, and I no, we were just 20th. we were just directed by council. Yeah, the end of to, March twentieth to put this on the agenda, okay. the warrant, yeah. because it met all the legal qualifications. And I had the similar issue that you did was. Um, I had to ask Jonathan Boshin of FCAT to post, like, there were, like, he gave me the links for three meetings. I thought there was something on the 17th, but all the last one I got was the 16th of April. And um, so 
he's looking to see if there was a meeting that he didn't post on, you know, the YouTube channel yeah. that FCAT runs. Yeah, and there's all the dates are. It's hard, hard to figure it out. They don't go in order. You'd think no. they go in order, right? And the minutes, sometimes you can't. I couldn't find, I thought if I look at school committee, I couldn't find a lot of things. So yeah. apparently they're not posted right no, away. Yeah, they don't. They have to get, they have to yeah, get. That uh, would make voting. it easier to be honest. And then the next you. month, then they vote on those drafts and then they get posted. Right, so I know, draft, I know yeah, I'm a clerk on, right. on yeah, you an get association it. that I want yep. to. Yeah. Can I make a motion to adjourn? Thank you, Charlene. Yeah. I'll second that. Thank you. All those in favor. Tim Hilchey, aye. Trevor McDaniel, aye. Carolyn Ness, aye. Thank, Thank you. you all. Thank Have you. a great night.